Okay, shall we start? Yeah, I think maybe we can we can get started. Yeah, if everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Distinguished delegates, experts, and participants. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome all and thank you for joining us today to the workshop on the digitalization of tax administration in Asia and the Pacific. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Hamza Ali Malik, Director of Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division of UNSCAP to give opening remarks. Kun Hamza, the floor is yours. Thank you, Petra. Good afternoon, colleagues, experts, participants. Very warm welcome from Bangkok to this regional workshop on the digitalization of tax administration in Asia and the Pacific. Um, this is our second workshop on tax issues. Uh, we had one actually yesterday on taxing the digital economy. Some of you may have participated in that as well. As part of our latest work on supporting countries in enhancing tax revenues and thus improving fiscal space. It is uh, no exaggeration to say that we are experiencing very difficult economic circumstances currently, globally and in Asia and the Pacific. The COVID-19 pandemic brought havoc on economic activities and public finances and exacerbated the challenges of effectively pursuing sustainable development. The ongoing war in Ukraine has only made matters worse. Substantial fiscal and debt pressures, along with rising inflation and increasing interest rates, suggest limited policy space going forward. Policymakers need new opportunities and ideas to strengthen their fiscal position to cope with these challenges. In this context, it is worth highlighting that the average total tax revenue collection in Asia and the Pacific as a percentage of GDP is considerably lower, around 20% of GDP, compared to other regions and advanced OECD countries, which is around 34%. Admittedly, paying taxes is one of the more difficult and time-consuming activity for most citizens in almost all countries around the world. Nevertheless, to be able to finance public goods and services and effectively pursue sustainable development, governments need to increase tax compliance and collect sufficient revenues. Better tax administration contributes to higher tax revenue collection and other economic benefits actually by reducing tax avoidance and evasion, including by influencing people's willingness to pay taxes. The benefits of effective tax administration also go beyond tax revenues. Research shows that better tax administration helps narrow the productivity gaps between small and large firms, for instance as smaller companies typically face higher tax compliance cost. The quality of tax administration depends, among other things, on effective tax legislation and its enforcement, increasing the use of digital technologies in tax operation, which is the focus of discussion today, adopting risk-based compliance control, and training of tax officials. Some indicators of good tax administration include a low cost to collection ratio, a higher actual to target tax revenue ratio, and high filing and payment compliance rates, as well as timeliness and quality of tax services. We have been researching on these issues for some years now. In 2018, ASCAP developed a tax administration index that examined three broad areas and put them together in an index form. Number one, institutional arrangements that grant autonomy to tax authorities, or business functions that facilitate the uh, compliance and use advances in technology to enhance tax collection, and a legal and regulatory framework that enables tax authorities to gain access to information in order to validate taxpayers' liability. Our research found that the quality of tax administration in developing Asia and the Pacific, in terms of its relationship with the tax GDP ratio, for instance, is weaker than in developed countries and developing countries in other regions of the world. Our research also found, based on a regression analysis, that a one point increase in the value of tax administration index is associated with the tax revenue increase of 0.15% of GDP which is reasonably significant. So point I'm trying to highlight is there are gains to be had in trying to strengthen the effectiveness of tax administration, including through use of digitalization tools. 
There are several policy issues that need attention to address these issues. The focus of today's workshop, of course, is on improving the capacity of tax administration in eliminating compliance barriers and increasing collection using digital technologies. In the past decade, the rate of digital transformation has accelerated as the price of the digital technology has decreased and application development tools have become more user friendly. For instance, not too long ago, cloud storage was nearly 50% more expensive than it is today. The digitalization of tax administration not only plays a crucial role in assisting tax authorities in reducing compliance and administrative costs, but also help collecting revenues in a more effective manner, improving taxpayer services and transparencies and accommodating big data flows. So some of the aspects that we captured in our tax administration index. Based on a recent report that actually will be presented in today's workshop, we expect the future of tax administration to look different. Administrations will have access to encrypted distributed ledgers that will enable smooth real time data collection and monitoring. Artificial intelligence will increasingly complement and strengthen the judgments of tax authorities. However, the point to note is that the system must be continuously monitored for faults and accountability for mistakes must be clearly established. With digitalization of tax administration, the tax system is expected to become considerably more accessible. Services including pre-filled tax forms, possibility for taxpayers to access their own filing information, and data exchange between banks and government agencies can help accelerate credit approval will become more and more common. Today's workshop examines how tax administration in, the, in Asia and the Pacific have been utilizing digital technologies to enhance the, their capacities. Our objective, together with our supporters and partners, the experts that have joined today, is essentially to support countries, policymakers, as they begin planning processes, and we highlight several implementation considerations for digitalization of tax administration. So let me now hand over to my colleagues to initiate the substantive discussions, and I wish you a very productive session. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you. Thank you, Kunhamsa, for the opening remarks framing what we will be discussing today. I would now like to invite Mr. Alfonso Peregrino, consultant at Financing for Development Section, to moderate the first session on the state of digitalization of tax administration in Asia and the Pacific. Over to you, Alfonso. Thank you very much, Kumpachara, for the kind uh, int uh, introduction. And thanks to all the distinguished panelists and participants for, for taking part today in our workshop, which is going to be on the digitalization of tax administration with a particular uh, emphasis on the Asia uh, uh, Pacific uh, region. Recent uh, advances in the digitalization of tax administration include the automation of tax uh, uh, reporting and compliance uh, uh, operation, which can benefit countries uh, with the use of innovative solutions, such as, for, for instance, incorporating artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning, and real-time monitoring processes. The goal of this first part of this workshop is to present the findings of our manual, which is titled The Digitalization of Tax Administration in the Asia uh, Pacific, which is going to be presented by Professor uh, Frank Chan, who is a professor of information system at the ESSEC uh, Business School. After that, we are going to have an uh, exchange of knowledge and experiences regarding the current status of digitalization of tax administration in Asia and the Pacific in order to identify uh, issues and potential uh, solutions with uh, distinguished panelists. We will have a presentation from Ms. Uh, Rachel So, head of the Asia Pacific for the International Bureau and Fiscal uh, Documentation, which is going to share broad consideration regarding tax uh, uh, administration system. We will then have also a presentation by Professor Jenny Granger, Professor of Practice School of Accounting, Auditing and Taxation at the University of New South Wales Business School, which is going to talk about the experience of Australia and uh, New Zealand. After that, there is going to be a presentation from Professor Tapan Sarker, Professor and Head of Finance at, at the School of Business of the University of Southern uh, Queensland, 
And uh, last but not least, of course, Mr. Denny Vissaro, manager at DDTC Fiscal uh, Research and Advisor, who is going to share a little bit of insight regarding the uh, Indonesia's uh, experience. I ask uh, to all the distinguished panelists uh, to have a presentation of 10 minutes and to please abide kindly to the, to the allocated time. A uh, question from the, audiences, uh, from the audience might be typed in the chat box. Then this question will be bounced to the panelists at the end of this first uh, uh, session, as much as time uh, permits. I take the chance to, in, to give the floor to Professor Chan to present the findings of our SCAP manual. So, Professor Chan, the floor uh, is yours. Okay, thank you, Afonso. So let me share my slides. Is it okay? Yes, yes. Okay, so 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 uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Frank. I'm from uh, SF Business School and I work with SCAP for some time already on this project. So for today, I'm going to give you a brief overview, so not to take too much time. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, the roadmap for my presentation. So I will give an overview of the develop, evolve, ev evolution of test administration and in particular uh, in the region of Asia Pacific. And then I will provide an overview of the technologies that are used in test, test administration. So uh, I'm sure we will see some more examples later today, so I will not uh, go into too uh, much details. And to wrap up my presentation, I will give a few remarks on the future of the uh, digital test administration. So first of all, so this is the, the roadmap of the uh, evolution of test administration. So basically, like we are, uh, we have seen like in the old days, like people were, were doing paper-based test filing, for example. So the processes are actually, most of the processes are manual and uh, were done by human. So uh, these are uh, different uh, agencies, they work independently so there's a silo processes and the system were not interconnected with each other so it's pretty hard for uh, test administration to do risk assessment so basically we uh, they had to wait until everyone finished their paper-based filing and then so they can look up into the data to to do risk assessment and in the age of test administration 2.0 then we add we bring in more technologies basically we refer to e administration or e-tax in general so basically the purpose is to automate the process using it some tools like it can be websites it can be different systems that allow people to do the job on the computers okay and then so at this stage uh, the governments are able to connect with some part of the uh, different part of the government and also some part of the private sector so that they can get a little bit of the data from different sources. And this process will allow the test administration to detect non-compliance more easily because everything's become digital. And in the most optimal form, so basically it's the test administration 3.0, some of the advanced countries in Asia like Singapore, Korea, they are already at this stage. They have applications that allow uh, the test payer and also test administration agencies to to be connected with each other so that as soon as transactions happen the data can be coming from the source from the test payer to the test administration at, at once so basically that when uh, when the transactions and business take place then the test administration will have a good idea what has happened and they can detect problems okay so real time and we have observed like similar development is particularly in the Asia Pacific country, uh, Asia Pacific region. So uh, basically like there are countries at the very beginning of this development, they are like doing some basic conversion of paper-based process to digital processes. So uh, in some countries that they may be still using uh, paper-based test filing together with online websites. Okay, so, so uh, so this uh, so this uh, this basic conversion will have to improve uh, efficiency to some extent, and in some countries they even impose the compulsory e uh, online filing of tests like in Singapore and Japan. So for corporations they must file tests online, so using the system. And in the second stage we have seen examples of like uh, countries that implement more advanced technologies like data analytics to help to understand the data that. Uh, are provided by the test payers. So for example, in Singapore, so they have a surface called no filing surface. Basically like the test returns were, uh, are pre-filled 
by the system, so by collecting data from multiple sources and from previous history of the test records. So that like uh, reduce the uh, burdens of the test payer not to fill in the uh, test again and again every year. OK, and in the last stage, basically like some countries again, like it can be uh, uh, advanced countries like uh, like Singapore, China, Korea, they are using more advanced technologies like AI blockchain to govern the data that is shared between the test payers and the test authorities. So uh, the, the, actually the control and decision making power are being shifted to these technologies. For example, like some countries may use AI to screen the data to identify some problematic transactions. OK, so this is the way that uh, people try to uh, leverage the capability of technologies to make decisions instead of going through all the uh, processes manually. And so this is an overview of the technologies being used in tax administration. So all of these are actually facilitated by the improvement in computing capacity, the invention of different uh, data algorithms or techniques that help to look through the data set. So, uh, so for example, cloud is one of the major uh, advancement in IT that allow companies to have the enough power to run sophisticated analysis on the data that they have. For example, data analytics, artificial intelligence, and even blockchain are built on the cloud infrastructure. So I'm sure we will see some examples later today from different countries that are making use of these uh, different technologies. So for the time being, I'm not going to go into details of all of this, so I'll just go through some of the examples later on. And so the current trends in Asia Pacific is like, so uh, we have seen like more collection of digital data. So we now try to get away from paper-based processes. We want things to be done in dig digitally. So like test filing online or a collection of data files from different sources, or even like digital data com coming from some machines, internet of things. Like, so when you make online payments, so the data will be transformed automatically in digital format to the test authorities, okay? And, and that the point is about the advanced use, the use of advanced analytics. So it can be examples of uh, AI or machine learning that try to identify patterns within test payer data. So it can be like uh, used for analysis for cross setter cross segment comparison of test, test payer data to, to identify those risky test payers or test returns. And so this is good for the purpose of uh, compliance. So we can identify problematic uh, files. And the last point is that like so many of the uh, test authorities are encouraging the test payers to, to go online to, to do uh, their services online on a single platform. So this is to uh, help to reduce the learning cost as well for the test payers, also help uh, the test payers to get a sense of how they should do things digitally so that over time they get used to uh, using the services they can provide and get more uh, information and services from from the platform easily. So at the end, so it helps to improve the efficiency and uh, satisfaction of the test payers. So a few more slides from me. So, uh, so an example is from Singapore. So the use of AI. So basically is to uh, use some machine learning algorithm to analyze some email queries. So basically, so uh, test payers may have questions when they do the test filing. So they may send emails to the authorities. So uh, of course, in the old days, we, we have people reading the emails, but with AI, it's, it can be done using computers. So this is the example of the use of test mining to identify the keywords that people put in the emails queries, so as to identify the problems that are uh, in the communication between the test authorities and the test payers. So to identify like uh, whether like the communications switch are problematic, so it may uh, create confusion in the test payers' mind. So that when when they send the email queries, they, so the test authorities will try to see what are the gaps, what are the confusion points. So this is to help to fine tune the future communication to the test payer to make sure that they can use the self service to do the test services easily. And the second last slide for today is about the blockchain. So uh, we will see an example later today from our panelists here. So, so this example from China that used blockchain to support e-invoicing. So but the idea is that is to use the blockchain system to connect the test authorities and also the payment system. So when people purchase things online using the e-payment system, the, the transactions will be uh, recorded and transferred also to the test authorities automatically. So this is to help uh, the test authorities have a better sense of the data governance over the transactions so that uh, it's easier for them to detect problematic uh, uh, 
uh, uh, transactions. And finally, so the, for the future, so that few key points here. So we have seen like uh, the examples of China using blockchain to connect systems. So basically, it's the first point. So connected test ecosystem. So there will be more connections between governments and also uh, private sector, so that they can exchange information easily. And the second point is that like uh, the tax system will be more embedded into natural system. So the natural the term natural system means that these are the system that people are using in their daily life or daily work. So for example, we have shop online, so you pay online from, from the website. So the website is actually kind of a natural system to the online shoppers. So uh, the tax will be uh, embedded in those systems so that like uh, the transaction can be recorded automatically and be transferred to the tax authority. And the third point is about data driven test assessment and all this. So with the advance of the big data, AI, machine learning, so it make it easier for the test administration to assess the test and to do auditing. And final point is that because of the fact that now we rely so much on digital data, so governance become an important uh, important concern. So it can be the governance of the data sharing and also the use of AI, for example. So there is a, a of a recent discussion about the governance of AI in, in the European region. Okay, so, so we'll see more examples from different countries later today, I'm sure. So ho I hope you enjoy uh, the later sections. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Chang, for your insightful presentation and for also being able to keep the time like exactly as it was allocated. So I found particular like uh, important one of the points that you uh, raised, especially uh, when we are talking about promoting uh, data transfer between government agencies and private sector in order to minimize the overall administrative uh, load and to provide maybe a more business friendly uh, environment. So now uh, we may go on uh, with the presentation from uh, Miss uh, uh, Rachel So. As I mentioned uh, earlier, she is the head of Asia. Pacific for the International uh, Bureau of the Fiscal uh, Documentation. She has over 20 years of experience in dealing with cross-border tax uh, issues from both a tax administration and tax policy perspective. Her work and expertise is currently focused on the Asia-Pacific uh, region, with particular uh, attention to the challenges faced by uh, uh, developing countries in today's tax environment. She will share a presentation where she will uh, introduce broader consideration regarding the digitalization of tax administration. So dear uh, Ms. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alfonso, and good day to everyone. And my thanks to you and ESCAP for having me here today on behalf of IBFD. Now, a common criticism of the tax world is that we lag behind the real world and are constantly playing catch up. We don't operate in the same world as businesses do. As a matter of fact, the tablets that we use are carved out of stone. That's how out of touch we are. And the transformation that the digital age has brought about, coupled with that of the pandemic and the need for non and the um, lack of physical presence required, this has made the gap even more apparent. So it is against this landscape that today's workshop and the report prepared by UNSCAP is a very timely one. The modernization of tax administrations is a hot topic and it is high on the agenda of many administrations themselves, international organizations and fund agencies. Um, I see Daisuke from the ADB is here and it's also very high on their agenda and they have big plans for it in the following years. So this is a very, very timely um, workshop and you know, really, I'm really glad that UNSCAP is really looking into this, especially uh, for the benefit of smaller countries who um, may be a bit slower in catching up with this. And hopefully today you will have some well, weapons to arm yourself with when dealing with your ministers and trying to get all these projects approved. Now, it's a very packed program today, so I will not take up a lot of your time. I'm not the star, so, but I will just give you a couple of points to keep in mind as you're listening to the other sessions and think about how relevant it is for yourselves. Okay, at this point, I will share my presentation, which is very short.
I think, hang on a second. I may have the wrong window up. No, sorry, just a bit. Now, key to the successful implementation of an uh, initiative as big as this is understanding and knowing your objective. It's really easy to get swept up in all the jargon, in all the functionalities and all the gizmos and whatnots. So it's important to really know what it is you must have as an administration and what's a nice to have. It's not all about blockchain, blockchain, AI, cloud computing. Um, those are great things to have if you can and if it suits you. But if it doesn't, there's nothing wrong with going for something a little more low tech, but equally as functional and equally as user friendly for you. So as you're thinking about implementing a system think, or, or introducing uh, a new system, think about what it is you want. Do you want to start off with a basic system? Um, something as simple as a website with all the information in it and maybe downloadable PDF forms. Is that what would suit your taxpayers and your tax administration best? Or something a bit more intermediate, like um, Professor Frank Chan was saying earlier, you know, uh, Tax Admin 2.0, where you have all this information on this website and as well as the ability to submit your returns online, to make payments, mm -hmm. and would that just be annual returns or are we looking at a pay PAYE or withholding tax? Do you want to couple that off with a mobile app? Is your Are your taxpayers of that, that um, tax savvy that they would prefer a mobile app? Do you then eventually want to be able to mine for data and share this with other agencies? Is that the end goal? And is that also not only for just um, ease of compliance, or would you want it to become something that would also guide your taxpayers? For example, self-starters and entrepreneurs, how to prepare accounts, how to submit those accounts you know, to, to the tax authorities. These are things that you should be thinking about um, what you would like at the beginning, what you can have, what you're happy with now, and what you would eventually like it to grow into, and to what extent. Other things to consider would also, um, would you want indirect tax to be incorporated? Are we looking at eventually having e-invoicing, all of these things on the same site? So understanding what the objective is and knowing what you want is key um, when you are setting about your strategy and your roadmap for modernizing the tax administration. The next thing you would want to think about is who. Who is this for and who uh, is this going to benefit? Would it be your internal users or your external users? And who are the, you know, the stakeholders being yourselves, uh, your taxpayers and the government? And what is this you need to um, do to convince them or even encourage them to adopt this, this modernization? You know, when devising your tax uh, digitalization policy, it is important to know your uh, your stakeholders in terms of things like age, uh, your social class, your education, how literate they are. Um, do you need more video graphics? Do you need more infographics rather than words? Um, things as to computer literacy, how comfortable are they with using a website? How comfortable are they with using a mobile app? A younger population <laughs> than an aging um, and would probably be more receptive to a movie than an actual website. And this will impact where your resources should be allocated. Should you be spending more time on a, an app uh, rather than a website because that's what your population prefers or will they find it easier to access? Um, and, and in terms of accessibility, geographical considerations would have to come into play and the infrastructure that you already have or are planning to have. City dwellers would obviously be able to get more use out of all these uh, digitalization and therefore would find it useful and easier to comply with. Whereas those who are a bit more far out may find that patchy reception would be a hindrance and prefer to do things the old fashioned way. You know, sometimes the answer to all these questions is to have a mix of both, but even then you would need to know where you want to allocate those resources and how much of it you want to. Other things to consider is your economy or, or your um, your taxpayers themselves. Are you going to go monolingual or multilingual? Uh, for example, Macau has three official languages. You know, uh, in Malaysia mm -hmm. we only have one official language, 
but we have more than five or six languages or dialects that are widely used. And how much time and effort are you going to be putting to this to, to translate? And that would depend on the um, taxpayers or the population that you're trying, or the sector of the population that you're trying to um, attract and encourage. And finally, you'll be looking at, at the when and the how. How are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? What is the plan? Is it a phased rollout? Um, which ones first? Would you start off internally first so that you are prepared for when the time comes up to reach out to your external stakeholders, your taxpayers? Or would you try to do both at the same time? And which part um, before, you know, which phases would you like to roll out first? And then at that point, you might want to take an inventory, a stock take. Uh, most of us are digitalized to some extent, and then the question is to what, um, where do you need to go from where you are? What's your starting point? We all have different starting points. Are we looking at uh, changing a lot of hardware? Are we looking at just changing a lot of software? Um, are we looking at changing servers locations and moving on to cloud computing? It's countries who are in more vulnerable geographical locations where they are more susceptible to natural disasters may prefer to opt for cloud computing because they don't have to worry about servers being destroyed or damaged in cases of flood or earthquake. And uh, in, in addition to looking at your technology, you also need to look at your legislation. Now, this is important. Your tax administration was drafted maybe on submissions of physical forms and deadlines, and that may need to be reworked to allow for digital submissions or digital um, exchange of information or wider exchange of information. And you also have to think about what is being put aside for maintaining and what is going to be put aside for upgrades and growth. And that's something that sometimes we forget when we are look, putting out a proposal to, to our ministers. Uh, um, this is how much I need to maintain what we're putting in for the next three years. And this is how much I'm going to need to grow that. And those are two very different budgets. Technology nowadays gets outdated very quickly. Once upon a time, it may have been OK to change your your computers every five to six years, but now we're seeing that the software is growing so fast that the hardware itself needs to be changed every three to four years. And these are things to take into consideration. And finally, um, key to any adopt, uh, adoption of the digitalization of a tax administration is trust. So a lot of time will need to be spent on data security and building that taxpayer confidentiality. Um, taxpayers are by nature very distrustful of anything new, especially if it's pulled up, pushed out by the tax administration. So they will be concerned about their data being leaked, about it being hacked, um, a lot of it about whether the payment actually goes through to the right place. And one thing that we have had to deal with, and a bit of a personal experience here, well, not really personal, but local experience is uh, with scams. You know, people in, um, impersonating tax authorities and reaching out to taxpayers and trying to get, you know, convincing them that they've got something owing and they have to transfer money. So these are huge things that we have to deal with. Uh, in Malaysia, what we have adopted, and I think um, once we may, maybe can go into that a bit later, is we've used mm -hmm. a, Two, twofold process. We actually reach out only to taxpayers by official letters, nothing electronic, nothing digital. And from that official letter, do we have a contact number, email address for them to reach out to somebody digitally? And that is a way of um, trying to avoid people from being scammed by all these people um, via the phone or via emails. So trust is a key thing that needs to be built not only with your taxpayers, but also internally with your own officers. So that's uh, that's really um, a lot to take in. But as I said earlier, th this is a hot topic and on the agenda of many administrations and agencies. So you, there is a lot of support and help out there. And um, which, you know, I think uh, if you ask the right people, you will get access to. And it's on that note that I shall end my little presentation and let us get on with the more interesting stuff. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. So, for your comprehensive presentation. I found particularly uh, interesting your points when you were saying that you do not necessarily need, let's say, the most high-tech and fancy 
tools, uh, but actually you have to key in and keep into consideration many other factors when you're actually uh, digitalizing your tax uh, administration. However, now, exactly. I, I wouldn't give my grandmother, a, you know, an iPhone 14 because that's just not going to work for her. You know, so I think if you take that same approach, um, then you won't go far wrong. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now moving to the next presenter, I would like to uh, introduce the journey that Australia and uh, New Zealand have been since they have been at the forefront of in, uh, innovation when it comes to digitalizing tax administration. Let's now explore what have been the leading strategies that both countries' tax authorities have implemented to enhance digitally their tax ad administration. I have the pleasure to invite Professor Jenny Granger. She spent five years as a commissioner and director general at the HMRC in the UK, where she led the transformation and double compliance revenues. She specializes in contemporary tax system and administration uh, issues, and also has a strong interest in leading transformative change in legacy organization and fostering global uh, principle of responsible business practice. So, Professor Granger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alfonso, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Um, Sorry, uh, so I just share my slides and I should just confess uh, before going to HMRC, I was a second commissioner in the Australian tax office. So I take that into account when I talk about the journey um, on, on these slides. Um, I'm going to, um, so I'm going to do uh, just very quickly try and give you some insights around those journeys. And I just want to confess that it's um, it's drawn from work I've done with various colleagues. Uh, with Adrian Sawyer, we I did a two country study of Australia and New Zealand. And at the time, we were actually asking our question, had that journey um, made those country, were they, did that mean they were digitally prepared to support their governments during COVID? Um, so that was actually the question at the time. And then a fun piece I did with some other colleagues where we actually tried to look beyond what um, tax 3.0 might be to, is there something even more radical and disruptive coming? So I'll just give you a little flavor of both. Um, and I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. So look, um, I'm not going to articulate everything, but insights from the two journeys. So the first thing I want to say, and it echoes a little bit what Rachel says, is it's easy to look at Australia, New Zealand and some other countries and think, well, yes, of course they can do X, Y and Z because look where they are digitally. But that's not where they started. In fact, I would describe, and I was at the ATO at the time, the, uh, we had very creaky foundations. We had a patchwork of systems, um, very old fashioned at the time. And why why did we get into those digital journals? Basically, it was that whole point that was being made about keeping pace with both government, community and business expectations um, as they started to embrace new technologies. I apologize, I don't know why that's doing that. Um, as part of that process, they did move to new platforms um, uh, which had important internal effects. I, I wouldn't say it's a choice about doing internal or external first. It's about understanding how to bring the whole journey along. But the first and biggest and dramatic change that changed how work was done was not just automating tasks, but it was that work got connected up nationally in both organisations, which meant not only that you could shift work around the country, but that you were um, expected to collaborate beyond your expertise. And that was actually a very significant cultural change for most for those administrations. Um, and, and the catalyst for the change was the desire to try and make service uh, more taxpayer friendly than it had been. And obviously the opportunity to to exploit data. Both of those were probably the key ones. What was key to success or led to failure were a, a, a few things were very key. One was flexibility. You might plan out what you think you're going to do, but technology and the community and businesses grasp of it were changing at various rates all the time. And you had to recognize sometimes you weren't on quite the right path 
or that a different opportunity had come up. The world had moved on while you were actually planning that out. So flexibility is very important and and, and keep considering that. Um, one that was actually not culturally um, in either organisation when they started the journey, but incredibly important to success and absolutely a cause of failure is if you did not engage and collaborate with taxpayers, with the tax profession, with any organisation that's going to be impacted by this. And by collaborating, I mean really inviting them into designing, you know, and, and, and actually telling you what worked for them and testing it out. And then the really tricky one of balancing all those different expectations. And the, the next challenge that's come already. Sorry, sorry, Alfonso. sorry, Jenny. Sorry to interrupt you. It seems that your presentation is probably in a show mode or something. I don't know if you can uh, fix it or maybe do you want me to 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 share the presentation for you? You, you can't see it. I can see it, but it just keep going by itself very, very quite quickly. Oh. The slide, oh. yeah. Shall I, I'll just um, let me just take it down and, and see if I can. OK. Right. Can you is it is it stable now? I is it, think so. Yes, yes, I think so. Now, now it's stable. Yes, yes. Sorry, okay. sorry. For I apologize. I'm sorry it's been shuffling through. Okay, let's move on. Um, just to touch on some of the, uh, where are they now in um, what they've done to transform servers. Basically, the initiatives, and this is to Rachel's point about why are you doing it, was to, um, the direction was to how to make it easier, more personalised, cheaper for taxpayers, cheaper for the organisation, to uh, with the idea that um, compliance will be better, more tax will be paid if you make it just easier to get it right. Um, and of course, that led to the most obvious thing, which was um, um, personalising digital tax returns. And that goes beyond pre-filling data in it. Um, the, the tax returns these days also have all sorts of other tools inside them that are context sensitive. So if you if you need to um, analyze um, your depreciation, there's a tool that pops up. There is advice that is context sensitive in the return. You don't have to go somewhere else to get it. It will pop up. There's also digital prompts, which we call nudges, which are saying, you know, this looks kind of strange for your occupation, what you're claiming here. Do you want to check this? Those kinds of things. Uh, for business, it's around um, uh, what um, um, we were talking about earlier about embedding in the business processes. So examples that um, the most obvious one is single touch payroll, where it automates the process of, um, of, of tax uh, reporting for businesses around uh, pay as you go, uh, pay, um, employee pay uh, taxes. Um, interestingly, I think a couple of things to really point out is um, that if you if uh, tax advisors are a big part of your system, it's really important to give them and enhance services to support. Uh, their role in the system, including much more access to data. So the same kind of pre-filling goes to tax agencies, comes to taxpayers so that they can have that information available for their, their, um, their taxpayers, their customers. And it's, um, I, I think um, one of the really big challenges is I'm not sure there's really a choice of which channels you actually have to service all of them and where it's actually gone is uh, with mobile app, apps in particular, that you are supporting access from any device at any time. So the notion that it, even might, though it might be automated um, service, it's not a nine to five, five days a week organization and business anymore. Um, and the other point is, and I don't, I certainly don't think either administration recognizes the time that they became a capability for government not just for administration. So um, there's now one digital entry point for all government services and, and a very big part of that is how tax is connected up to that. 
um, and indeed had not just data exchanged, but services. One entry point means a whole range of things. So other, um, other requests come along like um, managing a business register for whole of government use, those sorts of things. So expect that to, if, if it hasn't already for you, expect that suddenly you're developing more generic um, capabilities for the rest of government. I think um, others are going to be touching on smart data led compliance. So I'm not going to go into it in a great deal of detail, just to make the point that obviously um, it allows all kinds of different um, analysis and rapidly than has been possible for us, not just customer segmentation, but other ways of viewing risk. It might be a, a tax product or um, it might be a particular um, way of looking at who's the advisor, all sorts of different connections. It allows for automated nudging that I just mentioned. Um, so you, what we call upstreaming compliance and obviously um, the cyber sleuthing. But the problem with all of that, of course, is that those who engage in evasion and financial crime have also uh, developed digital capabilities. So this is something that just keeps the challenges keep on um, coming. Um, uh, the other observation from the journey is um, at the start of this journey, um, there really wasn't a lot of focus on administrative capability and interconnectedness. It was all about focusing on um, what are the policy solutions to digital. Uh, what has been incredibly important is actually developing not just um, uh, data exchange, automated data exchange like the CRS system, but uh, the organization's ability to work with each other across borders. And that has continued to grow and develop. It now isn't just uh, important that administrations are uh, building cross border task forces to look at um, serious crime. They're finding that the serious crime goes beyond tax. So it, you're suddenly you're learning to to work with a range of agencies, not just um, other administrations internationally, which has challenged a whole range of things, including how we think about sharing information because we've all learned to do that, um, tax administration to tax administration through competent authorities. And, and some of those things just simply don't work in this kind of digital digitizing world. And briefly on taxpayers and tax agents, I think probably the key point I want to make on this side, slide two of them. First of all, for tax agents, their businesses are fundamentally changing and have changed really. Um, the whole return preparation business that many of them had, uh, it has, has been automated or is being automated. And what is becoming more important is their analytical skills, their understanding of business and how tax applies to it and the advice they provide around that. Um, so much more key for them. And um, touching on something Rachel raised, I would also say that um, a, a thing that's important to learn is that online platforms and digital interactions are not always appropriate in every interaction. You need to be able to have um, uh, available other ways of being contacted and, and interacting depending on what is going on. Recognize it's not a it's not for every single thing. And certainly uh, there are going to be some who are digitally challenged and vulnerable where none of us yet have really solved. How do we um, ensure they have the benefits of the digital world, but also what are the special ways of that we need to think about them? Um, there's already been some discussion on uh, data transparency, sharing and governance. I will make two points only on this slide. One is for those who may not have been following along yet, there's um, an inquiry in Australia going on at the moment into RoboDebt, it's called, which is about data that was used by the welfare rate, tax data used by the welfare agencies to um, uh, assume the income of welfare recipients and send them bills. There's, um, it's raising really important issues about who's responsible for illegal, deci unlawful decisions made by AI. It also raises a quite interesting question about for what purposes should data be shared. It was legitimately shared 
but should it be used in a way that a, an administration would not use it itself? I'm going to skip over COVID. You can read that if you'd like to and just finish up very briefly with two futures ahead. Um, this this first one is about what is the new normal if we continue to adapt in the ways that we expect. Um, uh, definitely increasingly sophisticated interconnection between systems, potentially a key data hub for government, maybe the only data hub for government, and possibly a one-stop shop for business would be all things I'd describe as adaptive next steps. But potentially, and this is a slight build out on um, what Frank was saying in the very first presentation is instead of interconnection, where basically the data comes into the tax administration and, and is processed, what if it's completely embedded? Um, what if there is not a separate system and the governance of the data and the management is actually a cooperative issue out there? Um, the best, um, we've, we've already talked about um, that in the business context, but we did some analysis that said um, the way that banks are becoming financial platforms and bundling services and personalizing uh, through analytics their service to customers, they actually have most of the information to be able to produce the tax return themselves and send that off and then automate the payment or receiving of it. And that's quite interesting because that means the data that we the administration would normally have to risk manage and identify risk actually isn't held in the tax system anymore. It's out there in the banks. So, and I've just uh, under, put, underneath that put um, what some of that would mean for capabilities in what might be 4.0 for tax administrations. And Alfonso, on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Granger, for your interesting presentation and also for staying up so late <laughs> and for contributing very importantly to this uh, discussion on the digitalization of tax uh, administration. I found quite uh, remarkable uh, your conclusion about combining uh, network software and hardware, a tech savvy collaborative professional and managing like uh, data rights and, and governance to have in the future an embedded digital uh, ecosystem, a little bit like also what Frank has mentioned like uh, earlier on. Now, moving to uh, Bangladesh, this is a country whose economy and tax compliance position have been strained during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly due to uh, tax breaks declining industry uh, revenues and the ongoing effect of natural uh, di uh, disaster and climate change. Let's find out what have been the leading uh, strategies that Bangladeshi tax authorities have implemented to enhance digitally tax compliance. May I invite Professor Tapan uh, Sarker to, uh, to present. He has more than 20 years of experience in tax uh, administration. He has been the chief investigator of a range of interdisciplinary uh, projects supported by the National Climate Change uh, Adaptation Research uh, Facility, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Australian Council for International Agricultural uh, Research, the Asian uh, Development Bank, and also the uh, World Bank. So, Professor uh, Sarker, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I got a little bit of sore throat, so I hope uh, you won't mind that. Look, this research uh, is also joined by one of my colleagues from National Board of Revenue in Bangladesh, Mr. Sabir Ahmed, um, and myself. Uh, initially, we conducted this research for the Asian Development Bank. Uh, that project also involved EONSW and many others, um, universities and so on. Uh, but I was hearing the, you know, in uh, New Zealand and Australia's case, but now I'm going to present uh, developing country cases, right? Uh, where capacity is uh, is really not as good 
or as sort of compared to the developed countries. So we really need this context. And secondly, my particular focus uh, of research in tax uh, is mainly focusing on developing countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Pacific countries as well. So that's my expertise mostly. So let me uh, just see the agenda items that what it is going to do. And uh, through this research, we did a little bit of primary database research, uh, not a broader data set, but just some data from uh, the actual, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders of uh, taxation, particularly the direct taxation in Bangladesh, and uh, and also uh, presenting that that what it means to those uh, you know stakeholders, particularly the taxpayers, but at the same time tax uh, officials as well. So as you will notice that uh, clearly there is a, a pressure uh, of uh, of of all the tax administrations are facing at this moment, uh, particularly the emergence of the digital economy, right? Uh, and uh, the good news is Bangladesh is actually doing well compared to many other counterparts. I'm talking the counterparts of the developing countries context in terms of these uh, SMEs and digital economies, transformation and so on. And as you will see that many of the tax agencies, they are, are dealing with this, uh, you know, this system of tax filing from uh, transforming the conventional tax filing to more uh, the technology based uh, and e filing systems as such. And that is what uh, is needed moving forward. That's for sure. Now, in case of Bangladesh, it's a developing country, as I have said that, and uh, this also can enhance. That's my one of the hypothesis and argument, because there is always a lack of trust between the taxpayers and tax agency in any developing country. Uh, and we call it a principal and agent issues. And that's uh, Bangladesh is no problem, no exception, where you see that when you introduce more digitized system, that actually brings them together, can enhance this relationship uh, between the citizen and the states through, uh, through improving the tax compliance. However, as you see that adoption of taxation in, in Asia Pacific is relatively new, uh, we do not see any comprehensive study, so that's probably why we wanted to do a bit of pilot study, let's say, not a very comprehensive study, but just a little bit of study to fill the gap in the literature. And uh, further, as you will notice that, uh, yes, it is important to have a well-functioning tax system, particularly as all the countries have been affected uh, by COVID, and also before COVID, there have been some declining revenue from various sources. So direct taxes is one of the key for many countries. Now they really need to expand on that. So you see that the literatures are there to support that, uh, that really there is a need for a business case to adopt new technology to function uh, a tax system. So there are plenty of literatures in terms of that. However, I have seen uh, broadly that there are some lack of literature, and I hope SCAP will take some initiative into these, like the one was taken previously or re recently by ADB, that developing countries' cases together uh, that and to compile those cases that how and what kind of experience they may have. So that's basically the one of the key issues for me here. Now, if we look at a bit of theoretical background, like as I said, it is a really a research that we have done. So you need a bit of theoretical underpinning. And you see, we look into this theory that it says that, um, it, particularly the theory of economic growth in the era of digital economy, where you will see that uh, governments, of course, they try to mobilize resources, they try to spend more on public goods, but they can only do so, I mean, increasing spending, 
if there is also increasing revenue. Okay, so in fact, in revenue increase should be more compared to the you know spending uh, pace of spending. That's the ideal situation, but that's not always happen in 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 practice or in reality, right? So having said that, as you will see the behavioral economics and other studies that it says, there is a bit of psychological factors involved because as you all know, there have been a lot of studies about compliance. When you talk about compliance, there are a mix of financial, social, moral, and psychological factors that, uh, that actually you know, impact a taxpayer's behavior. Uh, and also there have been some uh, literature supporting from behavioral economics that is also working on that. So let us look into the data of Bangladesh uh, National Board of Revenue. And as you will see that uh, for a large country, uh, of course, uh, huge population compared to our many countries, but of course, there are only about, you know, this data, by the way, is 2020 data. So there are some increase of taxpayers by now. So that time it was about 4.9 million taxpayers and the authority is National Board of Revenue and uh, that's, that, was, that is actually responsible in pioneering that adoption of the adoption of the you know, digitization and automation there. So that is the data as you will see that uh, very healthy and promising sort of, you know, uh, increase of the tax file, uh, tax uh, sort of uh, taxpayers number, let's say. So you see the figure one, e-registration of tax file number in Bangladesh. So it is it is a very healthy and growing trend. And I hope that the last year and uh, the year before, so this year and the year before, it has increased as well. So as you see that uh, introduction of the ETIN that started in 2014, and that actually helped obviously. So it is very clear that that electronic tax identification number actually helped. So this is the case for Bangladesh that you will see. And, and actually in, in the last five years, it has tripled the number. So that's, that's a very good sign from there. So what did we do in this research? We wanted to talk to various uh, you know, stakeholders and uh, also we wanted to look into uh, the impact of COVID perhaps um, on tax administration efforts. Um, I think COVID has had so many you know, bad things, but there are some good things as well. And I think tax administration during this COVID um, everywhere they were a bit more agile they really relied more on digitization and the tax system and many of the donor agencies also wanted to help developing countries like bangladesh to really help their tax administration support to to really implement a digitized tax system which is great so now what we did is we wanted to include this tax per awareness impact of the digitization and as you all know that uh, UN SDG is uh, by 2030, all developing country or countries should really <laughs> have to achieve. So we wanted to link between these two, but we also wanted to see the challenges and also what are the tax development in response to the COVID-19. So we did a bit of in-depth uh, semi-structured uh, survey uh, that happened in just uh, about a couple of weeks in, in, in 2020, that was, of course, a time when COVID was there uh, and uh, and in March and July. So there are two times we did and there were uh, involved taxpayers, tax officials and alike. So uh, the recruitment of the of the, you know, the uh, respondents were not random. We have to take a bit of help uh, from uh, you know, how, whom we know. So it's a bit of purpose, it's sort of sampling. So you see the summary that there are about, uh, you know, uh, about uh, so 78 participants, about uh, 85% are male, 15% female, and mostly uh, there are good numbers from regional areas, which is great, but of course about 40% from capital city, 
a lot from taxpayers, but there were a few very good tax officials uh, and a member of the civil society, including students who are the future taxpayer as well. So let's see what we have received, the responses. So taxpayer awareness is very, very important to enhance uh, tax compliance. I'm talking about voluntary tax compliance. And the literature in the Nepland side, as you will see, that supports that view. Now, of course, uh, the good news is, yes, uh, we saw that the respondents, they really large majority, they know that uh, NBR's automation and digitization reform process happening. So this means uh, definitely then from NBR's perspective, I think they are really open now communicating effectively with uh, taxpayers, for instance, that, you know, a bit more receptive, they're, they're really open to others. Um, and uh, yeah, there is a bit of interesting gender uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, issues here that female respondent have shown a higher, relatively, relatively higher level of response, sort of awareness there. So what are the responses there is there, as you will see in the right hand side in blue color that a one senior private sector official, for instance, saying that awareness needs to be built up with around the year. Now that is uh, that is I know for a for a you know for an agency or for a um, for an institution like NBR it's very difficult uh, um, for the all all the year because the capacity needs a lot of people to be involved there. But this is something that NBR can take into account, and also other countries too. That all the year it is not just one taxpayer for in a year, but over the year. So that's what sort of uh, suggestions we have seen here. Uh, and then they said, yeah, it can be done with corporate officials, tax practitioners, lawyers, and presentations can be given to general tax payers during income tax payer, you know, which is very popular now. Now you see in the bottom that uh, civil society people also like to see that, uh, to bring the people in confidence. So that is also supported by the literature that we have uh, gathered and scanned through that. Bringing the confidence of taxpayer is very, very important, or say, let's say vital to enhance or to improve the uh, voluntary tax compliance there. So the impact of the digitization, so you see that also literature supports that when you do digitize a tax system, there are a range of benefits happen, as you see. And slightly more than 50%, about 60% respondent thought that, yeah, digitization of tax system has important implication in improving good governance. I think that is the way forward now, uh, not just for India, but other countries and developing countries in particular, that to really focus more on, invest more on, uh, build capacity more on uh, digitizing their tax system to really, you know, to really bring this benefit out. So you see the right hand side of the member of the civil society saying that uh, because of the digital digital transformation, income tax collection will be fairer. So that fairness issue is coming here, more trust only, resulting to increase in the number of income taxpayers. It will be less than public sufferings. Yeah, thereby can bring the taxpayers and NBA close to each other. Now, of course, the view of tax official at the bottom is that, as you see, that yes, there are issues as well, though it is clumsy and rudimentary approach, but yeah, yet online tax payments is, the tax payments is effective. So that's good from there. So very quickly, I will go through another, maybe another two or three slides. So taxation and the UN SDGs, as you will see, and I was going to see the link between the two, and good news is more than three quarters of them respondents uh, said also that yes, a good uh, you know internal revenue system can help improve uh, a sustainable economic growth of a country. And as we know about among the 17 sustainable development goals that is starting from poverty, that is number one, or number five is the gender issues and uh, so on. And where you really need a sustainable supply of, you know, or increase of the revenues and to really sustain the economic growth. And that is more important there. So you see here that it will help to increase the pace of income tax submission and will motivate more people to contribute to the economic development. So that's sort of, uh, you know, as you will see in the right hand side, as you can read from there. 
Now the challenges and the remedies. So yes, the literature like Jane and colleagues, the literature is saying that shift to a database digital economy and more importantly, shift to a, from manual to online tax system also can pose many challenges. And that challenges is it's not just a challenges to Bangladesh tax system. It can be everywhere, but it is more important for Bangladesh where the whole system and that that uh, system, I mean, the, you know, that infrastructure system as well, and also the human capability as well, that uh, is not compared to the many developed countries. So that is one of the key things there. Now, the challenges, as you will notice here, is the low level of computer literacy, technical knowledge among the taxpayers. So that's very, very important also for the senior citizens as well. Lack of proper collaboration between tax authority and taxpayers, and also other agencies like banks and so financial institutions. Lack of manpower and equipment, and also there are issues that has come through our study that there have been some corruption issues in the whole system, including the tax system as well. And you will read some of the responses from the right hand side that uh, there are some fearness um, uh, from many of the people about the technology and the technology fairness is, is very common, it's not tight, it's only there. And finally, uh, tax development, uh, you know, uh, with the COVID, uh, IMF's study also shows that uh, most countries during the COVID has caused a major decline in tax saving, right? And on top of that, most of the countries had to go into the debt and the debt level was increased because of the cash handout and so on. So overall participant had positive views about the potential role of the digitized tax system as they expressed the view that such a system will reduce human interaction, hence will create a hassle-free tax system too. So these are the positive side of the COVID that came and uh, it can be lost online as you will see the right hand side, some of the comments from there. So what is the conclusion? A study shows that yes, digitization automation of the tax system is still in the early A, early stage for Bangladesh, but that initiatives have been proven that it has improved the sort of image of the, you know, that um, that this revenue administration, as well as a bit of good governance in this system. So it's definitely a go ahead for the country. It also study reveals that use of digital technology in providing tax service can enhance tax compliance. From a policy perspective, this study provides insight about the role of the future reforms in the terms of tax policy administration. So it's not just for the country Bangladesh itself, but for the other. And this would help to develop a well-functioning revenue system, which is necessary for strong, sustained, and inclusive economic development in the region. So I stop sharing here. Um, as I said, that uh, this is completely a development country case studies. Uh, so it could be a little bit uh, different as many of you may not have the experience of the issues that are faced. But I believe also there are some participants here probably from Bangladesh or from India or from other countries in this region who understands the things that I have said, the issues and the challenges and the, I also did a bit of uh, works in Indonesia, so I believe there are some colleagues here from Indonesia as well. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor uh, Sarker, for the nice and remarkable presentation. I found particularly uh, useful the uh, results uh, of your study, which show that although digitalization and automation of the tax system are still at an early stage, such uh, initiatives have important uh, implication in improving good governance in the income tax administration in uh, Bangladesh. Now, proceeding to uh, Indonesia, the country has experienced uh, declining tax to GDP uh, ratio in the past and managed to partly uh, overcome it with the uh, support of uh, digital tool and digitalization uh, initiatives. Based on his studies and uh, uh, experiences, I would like to invite Mr. Danny uh, Visaro to share his perspective of what does he think are the broad elements of a strategy for uh, developing cooperative digital tax compliance models in emerging uh, e e e economies and achieving voluntary, more sustainable tax compliance. 
Mr. Tenney, uh, Visar research consists of fiscal policy, international uh, taxation, tax administration, public finance, and fiscal uh, decentralization. So, Mr. Visar, the floor uh, is yours. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Alfonso Pellegrino, and also UNESCO for having me. So yeah, I'm I'm Danny from uh, DDTC Indonesia. Uh, I I might not from uh, an, a tax authority, but I will share some experiences from Indonesia and particularly uh, my study on the um, particularly in cooperative compliance. So I have a few a few slides. I will try to to be concise here, and I will start by by responding to the to the question that was asked by. Uh, that was opened by uh, Mr. Pellegrino previously. That uh, actually, uh, yeah, Indonesia has has uh, recovered partly uh, regarding a tax tax ratio, but uh, in 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 terms of nominal value, yeah, we are still very low, still around I think ten percent of tax ratio to to GDP. So yeah, uh, of course there there are many factors that that might that helps us to recover uh, quite uh, fast. In compared to when during the pandemic, like there is also help from the commodity price and also uh, our consumption is still very growing. So, so that is part of the the factors. But also, uh, what, what I would like to share here is what uh, is uh, more about uh, how cooperative compliance is also part of the strategy in Indonesia, and more importantly, also how uh, digitalization and the utilization of technology uh, can be an important part to help us uh, to to thrive in during the, the pandemic and the recovery pace of the economy so firstly uh, there is a, an interesting uh, fact but also set at the same time for indonesia or maybe for several other developing countries that it is more likely that the taxpayers will have problem with tax authority when they pay the tax incorrectly compared to if they don't pay the tax at all so it's it's very uh, interesting because when it is the case uh, when the taxpayers is not sure about how much tax they should pay they they will be tempted to just not pay at all so they will not get into trouble uh, so why why it is why is it that the case? It is it is more um, uh, the number one the number one cause is that the government doesn't have the data from the taxpayers. There is a lot of uh, shadow economy and also hidden transactions that it is uh, very far from a uh, formal economy and that the size is quite quite very huge. So this is why cooperative compliance can be part of the answer. And then, uh, so I will start by what is cooperative compliance exactly? Cooperative compliance is actually um, similar or or actually the same to voluntary compliance. It's not a new uh, part or or new stage of uh, co uh, compliance. It is actually the more like a derivative for, from voluntary compliance in the sense that there is a cooperation or an exchange between the tax authority and the, also the taxpayers. What do they exchange in this sense? Uh, it is an exchange where the government can receive data or transparency from the taxpayers. But on the other side, the taxpayers also has um, certainty regarding their taxation. They have uh, more simplicity, they have more help and assist assistance so that uh, in the sense uh, the, the taxpayers also have uh, the benefits not just an, an additional of obligation and etc so that is why uh, cooperative compliance in this context uh, that already implemented in some OECD countries but I think it is very important that developing countries uh, should follow the same path in a way that maybe the form is different, but we have the momentum of digitalization and also uh, a lot of many uh, advancement in, in technology. So as long as there is an exchange between uh, transparency and also certainty, 
I think the the spirit of cooperative compliance can be more uh, implemented in a, in an effective way for developing countries. So in the model, how 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 we built um, the cooperative compliance uh, for developing countries. So we we should start with that uh, in initial condition there is a lack of trust, as our professor Tapan Sarkar already mentioned that. The trust between taxpayers in it and tax authority is very lacking. So when the government tries to collect data or ask for more transparency from taxpayers, there would be likely a, a high suspicion and reluctance from the taxpayers. And of course, we want we don't want that. So in a way to make that can happen, of course, there's a, a precondition that should be fulfilled by the government. The first one is participative policy making process. To ensure that the policy making is um, involving the taxpayers in how 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 they want to be taxed and how 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 much they should pay the tax, it should be more transparent from the first place where where the tax law is formulated. And then the second one is supportive tax administration, in a sense that even before the the cooperative compliance is built. The technology should be uh, aimed not only to enforce compliance, not only to collect um, more tax revenue, but also how to reduce compliance cost, which is now is still very high for taxpayers. It is very still uh, still very difficult, and 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 there is a lot of um, like I said before, if you pay that if we pay the tax incorrectly, they will have they will have the 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 weapon to to find the mistakes so that they can get us easier rather than we just hide in the in the in the shadow economy so that's why supportive tax administration is is very important to attract or to 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 bring light to the shadow economy so they uh, they can be more seen and then they can be voluntarily participating in the cooperative compliance in itself so yeah so if we if we are uh, from my study if we study how how cooperative compliance is implemented in in many countries uh, they usually start with a pilot program so it's not the exchange of transparency and certainty is not uh, initially started to broad taxpayers but uh, more like certain type of taxpayers so that there is a pilot program where uh, administratively the government can can firstly uh, make a uh, fine or uh, trial and error to, to to ensure that it can be implemented more broadly in the future and then after that if if it is successful in in uh, in short then it is it can be expanded not only as a pilot program but more likely as a paradigm that can be uh, spread not only for uh, corporate taxpayers but also for individual taxpayers so that is the, the the simple model for for in in short way, and then how digitalization can help. Actually, I will not talk too much about here uh, uh, about about that because it is already mentioned by the previous uh, speakers. So uh, the point is, the digitalization is is uh, should be utilized in a way that um, the government should not be tempted to utilize the digitalization solely only to um collect tax revenue in the short term i mean and it's only to detect non-compliance and then punish them uh, as as the law said but more like to how to prevent the non-compliance act so that the the taxpayers can be felt that they they, they feel that if they uh, pay the tax incorrectly it is not just uh, um punishment that they would get but before that, they can get uh, assistance and help and convenience to to pay the tax voluntarily and cooperatively. So that's the the, the main message of uh, this part. And then also, if we if we uh, emphasize more about the the practice in other countries, uh, I I take it uh, from the OECD report and other other certain reports. Uh, what is the benefit for the taxpayers in cooperative compliance? So that in a way that um, tax collection can be more sustainable uh, in the future, not only during um, during the 
the, the good growth or the conducive economy, but also during the crisis and also other uncertainty in the future. This is uh, what we can learn as in comparative studies is when the government tries to get uh, transparency or more data to 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 the, to get the profiling of the taxpayers. In return, they should also give uh, the first one is the num the most important is the, the disclosure of relevant tax issues by taxpayers in real time. Then I think uh, technology should have very important role to to make it. Um, uh, to bring more certainty for the taxpayers. And then the second one, I can also see that there is a real time solving of relevant issues. So in a way that if the taxpayers uh, would, would like to be open to the government, to the uh, tax authority, so what they would get is not uh, an exploitation, uh, quote unquote, but they should have uh, how this, uh, the, the solution that, that should be given to the taxpayers. And then also the third one in the cooperative compliance that we can learn from developed countries is uh, that there is also transparency on the part of the administration uh, itself regarding uh, what would they do for taxpayers if they keep non-compliant. So there is uh, just not a surprise act that taxpayers suddenly get uh, audited and etc. But it can be uh, given um, in the earlier before the non compliant X is uh, keep being done by the taxpayers. And then the fourth one is, uh, of course, uh, the tax position is, is uh, more likely the same, but the, the principle is that if the taxpayers want to be open to the government, so the, 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 the government or the tax authorities should also give certainty about their tax position, not just uh, uh, let the taxpayers uh, continue and then suddenly surprise them with uh, uh, enforced act uh, by the tax authority. So that, that's something that might be a temptation for tax administration in developing countries, but actually we, we, we hope that uh, technology should be utilized to be more like uh, helping and reducing compliance costs and more certainty to taxpayers. I think that is the the from my presentation, so the the principle is how to exchange between between transparency and certainty. But in the future, uh, uh, the principle is still the same, but it can follow the the transformation and the advancement from technology to keep the value the same. So that's all for me, uh, Mr. Pellegrino. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Misaro, for your presentation. I found very uh, uh, interesting when you mentioned that technology should be used actually to uh, reduce compliance cost and not for punishing in, in the short term. So I found that quite uh, insightful. So I would like to take this chance to thank all the speakers for this very first panel for your thoughtful and insightful presentation. Unfortunately, I think we do not really have uh, time for the question for this first panel because we have uh, run out of time. And maybe I would leave the floor to the moderator to start probably the second panel. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso, for your capable moderating the first session. Uh, we will now move on to the next session, Selected Good Practices and Digital Tools in Tax Administration. Uh, I would like to welcome again Professor Frank Chan uh, to uh, uh, moderate this session. Over to you again, Ka. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so thank you for your presentations, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists for this session. Uh, so, so for this session, we have five panelists. So we are lucky to have five. And so let me introduce each of them. So uh, the first panelist is Professor Yan Su. Uh, uh, is an associate professor of test law from University of New South Wales. Uh, she has expertise in, in com comparative test law and international taxation, and she does a lot of research on taxation in China. So she represent to us about a study on blockchain later on. And the second panelist is uh, Mr. Rez Shua, uh, who is the director of the Surface Experience Center of IS, IR 
AS from Singapore. Uh, he has expertise in the use of data and analytics to improve surface performance and detect test flaws. And he will later give us a presentation about the experience of uh, the translation of test administration in Singapore. And the third panelist is uh, Ms. Yelin Do, uh, the Deputy Director of International Cooperation Division of National Test Service of Korea. Uh, she will share with us the experience of test administration digitalization in South Korea. And the fourth one, the fourth panelist is, uh, let's see, Ms. Serenati Isa, uh, who is a senior test executive of the test operations department from Malaysia. So she will share with us the experience from Malaysia as well. And the final panelist will be uh, Mr. Saki Naranyan, so who is the head of finance and regulation as Amazon Web Service. So we know like Web Amazon is the leader in cloud computing. So he will share with us with the technology trends in the digital test ecosystem. So uh, so now I would like to welcome Professor Yan Xu to give her presentation about blockchain study in China. So the floor is yours, Professor Yan Xu. OK, OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and also thank you for the question. Uh, it was a great honor uh, for me to be invited and to present my research in the conference. And this research is a co-authored project uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, I should share my screen. <laughs> I forgot, I completely forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, let me say Windows. Somehow, yeah, I couldn't find my slides. Oh, maybe, uh, do you want me to share the presentation? For you, you can yes, please. Yeah, yes, please. And that'd be good. Thank okay, you. Okay. Somehow just sure, couldn't sure. find it from my own laptop. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. No problem. It's loading, sorry, it's a bit slowly. That's okay, thank you. Okay, all good, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, can you see the screen? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that is all good. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies for the delay. Uh, no problem, yeah, this. No uh, thank you. So this research is a co-authored uh, project with Professor Professor Ping Zhang uh, from East China University of Political Science and the Law. Um, we considered the question um, on whether um, blockchain can be used uh, in improving uh, tax administration and also uh, the implications of a blockchain um, um, and for tax um, for the further improvement uh, of tax administration uh, in China. So we use China as a case study. So specifically uh, in the research, we um, um, examined the key questions and China's sorry key issues. And China's tax authorities face uh, in tax administration, and then how um, blockchain technology can be positioned um, to address uh, the issues. Uh, we also discussed uh, um, the prospects and the challenges uh, of blockchain in China's further um, modernization of tax administration. And next slide, please. As, uh, yeah, as many speakers uh, have already um, discussed, uh, we are experiencing 
um, extraordinary technological advancement, uh, which is labeled uh, the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Um, blockchain uh, with its distinctive features uh, such as transparency, uh, accountability, and the decentralization uh, has been actively explored uh, um, by many governments uh, throughout uh, the world. And these features can be utilized uh, to assist and improve tax administration as, uh, as well as to uh, enhance tax uh, compliance. And next slide, please. And with this uh, greater potential, uh, we asked uh, in the research, and uh, to what extent uh, can technology um, contribute to the modernization of tax administration uh, in developing and the transitional economies? And these economies uh, usually have relatively weak administrative capacity um, to in enforce taxes and to grapple with uh, new challenges. And our research focuses on China, as I just mentioned as, mentioned as a case study. And China was chosen uh, because, of course, I'm familiar uh, with the tax laws and the practice in China, and also because uh, uh, it has been at the forefront uh, of technological innovation in the world. And the government has been keen uh, to use blockchain to modernize uh, its tax administration and to deal with serious enforcement uh, issues and that have been persistent in the country for many years. Can blockchain help achieve these goals? And this is what we want to find out in the research. And next slide, please. And here is a very brief overview of China's tax administration system. In a word, uh, the development of the system uh, lags behind the, de the development of tax law in the country. And tax administration used to be largely based on um, manual operation. And the use of modern uh, information technology only started from the 1990s. And however, the government has since made a significant effort uh, to modernize uh, the tax system. A very important uh, development in the country uh, is the introduction of the Golden Tax Project uh, in 1994. And the project was introduced uh, with the aim uh, to combine uh, various areas of tax fraud and also to improve tax collection uh, with regard to value added tax or briefly VAT. Uh, with the um, completion of the last phase, uh, phase three, um, the project uh, has now become a powerful information system. However, uh, some serious problems uh, uh, remain. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one problem uh, is uh, distorted information. And it is actually quite common in the country. And that is uh, taxpayers uh, fabricate uh, false information to avoid uh, taxes and also to obtain and tax and other economic benefits. A typical example um, in China's context um, is the use of tax invoices. The invoices um, have traditionally and until now, and until very recently, um, been the major source of information for tax authorities to obtain tax related information. It is because invoices are used as almost the sole and legitimate uh, and document or evidence and to verify and VAT input tax claims and to obtain export refunds and that VAT invoices uh, have become very valuable in practice. And many tax frauds uh, are related to use of VAT invoices. Uh, a second uh, problem um, relates to information exchange uh, within tax administration. Uh, in short, uh, the exchange uh, is insufficient. And also, there is a backlog uh, of a lot of taxpayer information built up uh, in the information systems. And tax authorities seem to have not been able uh, to process uh, the information in a timely manner. There is also a lack of communication between different tax data sets. And moreover, and there is a lack of information exchange between tax agency and other government and departments, as well as social and business entities. And these issues have undermined efficiency and the fairness of tax enforcement and compliance. 
blockchain technology might help address uh, these issues. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide basically um, illustrates uh, how blockchain works uh, using lending um, as an example. Um, I will leave it and just skip over the slide um, because um, I, I, I presume everyone understands how um, blockchain works. So um, at the very basic level, um, probably we move on to the next slide, um, please. Yeah. At the very basic level, we know a blockchain can be added to, but not modified, uh, suggesting it is secure. And its replacement of a centralized third party uh, for the provision of trust um, means uh, it cannot be easily manipulated by a single party. And once a record uh, is secured uh, into blocks uh, of interest, uh, the record is known to the public and no one would be able to change the record. And these features of blockchain are useful in addressing uh, the issues of information asymmetry and insufficient uh, information exchange uh, in China's tax administration. And in the research, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we examined uh, uh, the blockchain um, pilot project uh, uh, in Shenzhen. And as many of you may know, uh, Shenzhen is one of the most developed cities uh, in China and has been considered China's Silicon Valley. And the Shenzhen pilot project, uh, um, um, pa sorry, pilot blockchain and invoicing system uh, was rolled out in 2018. Under this system, um, digital invoices uh, are automatically uh, generated whenever a supply uh, supplier makes a sale and a customer makes a payment using a digital um, payment uh, uh, means. And the customer can use the digital invoices uh, to claim um, tax deductions uh, if they are eligible and the tax authority uh, can receive uh, real-time information about the entire um, process of sale payment and the tax deduction claim. The tax authority in Shenzhen has created a set of uh, original block and tax blockchains, uh, including a digital asset subchain and the information exchange uh, subchain. And very quickly, if we move on to the next slide, and the digital asset uh, subchain. Um, very, very briefly, the digital um, asset subchain uh, mainly focuses on a um, blockchain e-invoice system, uh, on the e-invoice system. And this blockchain uh, links uh, the issuance uh, of invoices by one party to a transaction uh, with online payment by another party uh, to the same transaction, and eliminating the disconnection, um, disconnection problem uh, in the traditional invoice uh, um, mechanism. And the next slide uh, shows some detail. And next slide, please. please. Um, this slide, sorry, I think we should uh, go back to um, the digital, sorry, information yeah, exchange uh, subchain. And the information exchange subchain um, has been designed um, with the aim um, to improve the efficiency of collaboration um, between different government departments and uh, third parties. And to achieve this purpose, uh, the pilot project created uh, the four uh, blockchain application platforms uh, as listed in this uh, slide, a natural person information sharing platform and tax and the industry alliance chain uh, for department information uh, exchange platform, as well as uh, uh, the last one, bankruptcy management linkage um, platform. I will skip over um, details here of the um, these four uh, application platforms. And now move on to the next slide. Uh, I want to discuss uh, briefly the prospects and the challenges uh, of the use of blockchain technology so far um, in the country. Apparently, um, blockchain has great potential uh, to assist the tax authorities in managing um, tax matters. Um, like many jurisdictions, China is eager um, to explore blockchain uh, for public administration. But on the other hand, um, in, it has been um, cautious about the potential risks and the technology may pose and to the security of sovereignty 
and due to its uh, decentralized feature, uh, remember um, blockchain one of the feature one feature um, of the blockchain technology is decentralization. And it is probably because of these potential risks and um, that some commentators have argued um, for the uh, the so-called solving uh, black blockchain. Um, but many agree uh, that the blockchain can be further utilized uh, in tax administration. So, for example, um, the current blockchain e invoice uh, scheme um, can be improved um, to become more effective for, uh, in preventing tax on, uh, fraud in, in general, and not just limited to the prevention um, of um, uh, prevention of AT uh, invoice uh, fraud. Um, moreover, a uh, blockchain can uh, be applied. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to um, can be applied uh, with the support of uh, um, other new technologies such as uh, um, artificial intelligence, big data, and um, um, machine learning, uh, etc., and to improve um, automation of tax collection and smart operation of daily tax management and also transfer pricing and investigation. Um, blockchain, um, next slide, um, please, um, is a promising um, technology, um, but it does have uh, limitations. Uh, one limitation is uh, that not all uh, blockchains have the claimed features of immutability and trustworthiness and participate, participate, participate so participant um, validation capacity. And also um, blockchain um, is not able to accommodate the challenges um, in interpreting um, open-ended legal terms and also unforeseeable um, events um, that have long existed in the legal systems. And in the China context, um, the development of tax administration uh, is not very even across the regions of the country. Uh, we have very developed uh, um, uh, regions such as uh, Shanghai, Shenzhen, etc. But at the same time, uh, the country has a very undeveloped or developing uh, regions. So basically, tax, the quality of tax administration is not even. Blockchain technology obviously will not be able to help overcome such challenges as capacity building uh, in developing regions. And blockchain also couldn't eliminate an arbitrary tax enforcement, although it may help improve uh, the process of tax decision making. For taxpayers, um, blockchain cannot help them um, keep pace with a vast volume of tax circulars and also very frequent uh, uh, changes uh, um, tax authorities uh, uh, introduce uh, in administering and collecting various uh, taxes. So to conclude, um, final slide, please. Uh, and I would say um, blockchain um, has uh, um, has the greater potential uh, to tackle information asymmetry and the insufficiency in information exchange, uh, improve tax uh, administration, and increase. Uh, and tax uh, compliance. And by the way, the pilot project in Shenzhen, um, at least according to some reports, um, has been successful. Um, the, um, um, however, I would say although the, uh, blockchain has uh, this uh, greater potential, it is not a panacea or a magic bullet. Uh, its potential to improve tax administration and the compliance um, is uh, limited. Uh, it's very necessary to take a cautious approach, in my view, and to apply uh, black uh, blockchain to taxation. Um, as otherwise, uh, it would waste resources uh, without really achieving um, desired um, positive outcomes. So that's all uh, about my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for Professor Su for giving us a very interesting use case of blockchain. So I, we can see like so uh, blockchain is, can be used to solve many issues related to uh, invoices in China. And I particularly agree with the point with the conclusion that like even though blockchain is a is like is a very effective technology, but it has to be complemented with a lot of planning and also a legal and regulate like regulatory frameworks to 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 make it like uh like uh, make it the right tool to use like to to deal with the problem 
So uh, let's move to the next uh, next presentation from uh, Mr. Rashua from Singapore. So he will give us a presentation about the uh, experience of uh, digitization of tax administration in Singapore. Mr. Rashu. OK, so the floor is yours. I think it's still uh, muted. I think you're muted. There are maybe some technical issues for uh, hello, Mr. Chua. Can you can you hear us? Oh, maybe he's trying to reconnect, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I should be here now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. 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 I'm so sorry. I've I've been having a network issues the whole whole time. It's okay. Um. Okay. You can see me, right? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um. Let me just load up my slides then. Okay. Out. I'm not sure if you think that's the case, Frank. Maybe I can share the presentation and uh, Mr. Chua can, oh. can just comment it. I don't know. He has disconnect, I guess. Yeah, maybe we can move to the next speaker, I think. Maybe shall we move to the next speaker if oh, it's okay? Why is Yavin yeah, Do is here? Yeah, I, I see her. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, can maybe, see her. Maybe we switch the, the sequence. Yeah, so, yeah, I think so. so Probably so, in the in so, the meanwhile, so. while we try to fix it, we can let uh, yeah. Miss Do do the presentation. Do, yeah. yeah, so welcome Miss Do. So uh, she is a director, deputy director of the 
of the International Cooperation Division of National Test Service of Korea. So uh, she will share with, with us an experience from South Korea. So, so please, uh, uh, Mr. The floor is yours. Yes. Uh, Thank you for your introduction. I'm pleased to meet you all. I'm Yerindo from International Cooperation Division of Korean National Tax Service. Uh, can you see my slide? Now you can uh, put it in presentation mode so that we can see the full screen. Oh. Can you see my slide? Yes. Oh, thank you. Starting from now with the topic of the digitalization in Korea Tax Administration, I'd like to deliver you our presentation. I will present in the following order. Since 1970, when NTS introduced computers for the first time among government agencies, NTS has steadily upgraded its IT system. In 1997, starting to utilize tax integrated system or TIS, we opened an era of the digital tax administration. Continuously, we started online based taxpayer service called Home Tax and the next generation tax integrated system, NTIS or Neo Tax Integrated System, and NTIS Big Data Center. Uh, the need uh, to sorry, so, oh. sorry, sorry to interrupt. So your slide does not yes. move. So, yeah. Uh, is it okay? You can try to move the slides to see if it's okay. Okay, okay now. Okay. Oh, I will continue. The need to advance consumption tax oriented taxation system has emerged to support the national financial demand as Korea's economy began to be fully industrial, industrialized in 1970s. In 1975, the NTS reorganized the tax system into a comprehensive global income tax system, which combined the consumption tax, which had been tax separated by income type. In 1977, the value added tax system was also fully implemented. VAT is managed by using tax invoice to analyze nationwide transactions and cross-checking purchase and sales details. Therefore, it was necessary to digitize the administration that could encompass the entire NTS task to conduct nationwide analysis. It was difficult to support the new system with the exist existing method of each tax office employer manually handling the work, but the NTS was able to overcome such limitations through the digitization. NTS introduced the mainframe and started processing large volumes of nationwide tax data, including VAT report data, income data, and others. In the 1990s, with the spread of PCs and internet activation, information and communication revolution commenced in full scale. On one hand, the issue of comprehensive taxation on financial income was raised within 
Korea, along with the development of financial industry and reorganization of related systems. Faced with such challenge, in 1997, the NTS opened the integrated system TIS by connecting nationwide tax office into one network and digitized all tax affairs. The implementation of TIS and providing one PC per employee, the tax affairs that were previously handled manually were digitized in full scale. As internet became active, home tax and internet-based tax service portal, including e filing was introduced. Also system-based tax source management, such as cash receipt and e-tax invoices, were fully enabled with the expansion of overall IT infrastructure in the society. Various e-tech services were blooming as the timing overlapped with the information and communication revolution. However, the system was built individually and as the information system became all jumbled up together, difficulties began to arise. First, the cost to operate and maintain the system increased. It was not easy to maintain consistency of taxation data managed by each individual system and conducting integrated analysis, which made it difficult to respond to environmental changes with the advent of the big data era. To resolve such challenges, the NTS opened NTS Neotex Integrating System that fully integrates the existing information system in 2015. Now let's look at how digitalization of tax administration contributed. The National Tax Service was able to innovate its tax payment service by implementing Home Tax, a comprehensive tax portal service that allows taxpayer to conveniently solve national tax related service online without having to visit the tax office. Home tax has not just grown externally by expanding the subject of refiling, but also has been steadily improving such as providing a pre-file service, which analyzes tax data retained by the NTS and filing out the report items in advance. We also provide a full build service which fills out all the necessary information for filing and the tax return is completed once the taxpayer simply confirms it. In the background of home taxes success, there were systematic support in addition to the NTS efforts to create the user friendly environment. Next. Let's look at the effort to digitalize, it, digitalize tax administration to realize fair taxation. As the IT infrastructure of the entire society expanded, an electronic tax source management system was established to improve the efficiency of the tax source management. The electronic tax source management system in Korea consists of credit card activation, cash receipt, and it tax invoices. There is a limit to legalizing all cash transactions by just activating credit card, so the need to make this better was raised. Hence, the world's first cash receipt system, which is a tax management infrastructure for cash transactions, were implemented in 2005. To activate cash receipt, taxpayers are provided with an income deduction or reward was given for reporting cash receipt issuance violation, and the issuance of cash receipt became compulsory. Through this report, the amount of cash receipt issued increased significantly. In 2009, an e-tax invoice system was launched to detect both tax invoices in real time and block them in early stage. In the beginning, e-tax invoices were not mandatory, but it gradually expanded the subject of mandatory issuance. 
Currently, 99.9% .9 of tax invoices are issued electronically. Implementing an efficient system is important for the success of electronic tax source management, but the systematic support is also crucial. It is essential not only to impose penalties, but also to increase voluntary participation by providing incentives such as income deductions. Moreover, services should be placed in so that the taxpayers can adapt naturally. Lastly, I will explain what our future strategies is for digitalization of tax administration. Although the digitalization of tax administration has achieved remarkably results, the tax administration environment is rapidly changing again. With the advent of the mobile burst era, the center of IT service has been reorganized from PC to mobile. Meanwhile, new sources of tax are rising, such as virtual currency and one-person media, and the risk of advanced tax evasion and intelligent tax evasion also increased in, with the digitalization and globalization. Through numerous inquiries and concerns, the NTS seeks to find future innovation engine of tax administration in intelligent information technologies such as big data and artificial intelligence. NTS established the Big Data Center in June 2019. In addition, we are researching to grab metaverse, blockchain, cloud technologies into national tax administration. Korea's NTS will not stop our efforts to continuously innovate tax administration by responding one step ahead of this wave of changes as we have done so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much from Ms. Do for her sharing. So it's a very interesting journey that South Korea has taken to arrive at this, this point. So uh, so it's particularly interesting to know like there's, there is some incentive that the government tried to provide to the test payer to use the system, even though the system was supposed to be very good already. So so it's very nice point that like there is should be a balance between penalty versus incentive. Okay, so this is a very nice point that haven't been covered in the previous presentations. So uh, so thank you for, thank you again for Ms. Dill for her presentation. So let's oh, welcome you. back again. Um, Mr. Restrua. Hi, um, I decided uh, okay. to not turn on my video. Uh, hopefully my, my computer don't crash on me again. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so so sorry back. for that. Let me just uh, put on my slides again and um, okay. let's see how. Is it showing? Uh, not yet, maybe. Uh, yes, now. It's okay now. All right, great. Um, so I'll just go ahead. Huh? OK, OK, thank you. All right, uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, greetings from Singapore. Um, thank you for having me to show how we, um, how Singapore actually digitalized our tax uh, service. So first of all, uh, I'm sure that all of you will agree with me that uh, COVID-19 has brought about many changes in the world, uh, in our personal lives as well as at work, and how organizations uh, do business. Uh, and we have been talking about digital transformation for years, um, but almost overnight we have seen an acceleration of uh, digital adoption, and this trend is certainly here uh, to stay. So for us in the public sector, um, we need to stay uh, competitive in this new digital environment, and in Singapore, uh, we want to be a government that is digital to the core and serves uh, with our heart. So across the um, public agencies in Singapore, uh, we aim to be more integrated, uh, more efficient and empathetic in serving the needs of our citizens uh, by adopting a digital mindset, uh, providing personalized and seamless online experiences for our citizens. Uh, so let me share with you some of our initiatives as well as our online platforms. So firstly, um, digital identity is very important. So uh, SingPass is our national digital identity and it is the key to create a seamless online experience across both the public and private sectors. 
so currently we have more than 2.5 million users or, or over 60% of our residents who are on the SingPass app and over 90% of them uh, use them at least once a month. Uh, so besides uh, accessing to services, it is also a convenient way for our citizens to uh, verify their identity, uh, digitally sign documents or remotely authorize transactions as well. Uh, so there is no need uh, now for us to remember uh, passwords anymore. Uh, and you know, similar to what we have on iPhone, uh, facial biometrics can be used to securely access our accounts as well as to complete uh, transactions. So also to provide our citizens with a more personalized and end-to-end -end, uh, digital experience, uh, we launched the Live SG app uh, two years ago, and it is also authenticated uh, using this uh, SingPass. Uh, and it is designed uh, based on the different life stages of our citizens uh, to seek, uh, allow them to connect and also uh, during the right service to the right services as well as uh, as and when they need them. So currently there are more than uh, 70 government services in this one app. And um, the impetus of this Live SG app is to make our citizens' life easier. So um, integrating relevant government services, uh, simplifying our processes, consolidating benefits, uh, announcement, or even uh, appointments that they may have with different government agencies, uh, it can be consolidated into one app itself. And right now you can do it through the Live SG app uh, without having to show up at the registration counter in person or switch between uh, the different uh, government websites as well. So in a poll of uh, government digital services in 2021, uh, we are heartened and said that the satisfaction level remained uh, relatively high uh, despite the stresses that we had in uh, COVID-19. And with the high um, satisfaction from our communities, uh, Singapore is committed to continue to innovate and digitalize uh, by increasing our Infocom budget. And the projected spending will go towards transforming digital services uh, across different sectors. Uh, government infrastructure, and also to adopt more AI to deliver better services. Uh, so that was an overview of what we're doing at the national level. Uh, so let me now zoom in to some of the specific initiatives that IRAS as a tax administration uh, is doing to redefine our taxpayers' experience. So first of all, um, as people's reliance on technology will continue to grow, uh, we as tax administration uh, will likewise uh, need to rethink our customer journeys and also to digitalize uh, the services to improve their experience. So um, to allow our taxpayers to access our digital uh, services conveniently, we provide uh, multiple entry points, uh, which ranges from what I just shared earlier, uh, some of the whole of government initiatives that we have, which is the SingPass app, the Live SG app. And of course, they can also transact with us through our own uh, IRAS website and portal. And to deliver a seamless um, digital experience for our taxpayers, uh, we must digitalize our end-to-end -end process uh, from filing to payment and even in the way we communicate and serve our taxpayers. So these four prongs uh, reinforce each other to help IRAS be digital to the core and create this um, digital experience for our taxpayers as well as our staff. So for example, uh, in terms of digital processes, uh, to help taxpayers fulfill their tax obligation in the most seamless manner and to maintain a high level of compliance, um, IRAS implemented the no filing service uh, in 2007, where taxpayers are no longer required to file a tax return as their tax assessment will be automatically computed based on information that we have gathered uh, through different government agencies as well as from the employers. Uh, yet, when there when tax filing is still required, um, the experience must be as simple as possible, right? And so uh, we decided to introduce this concept uh, called chat filing to allow taxi drivers, uh, private hire drivers and food hawkers, essentially the citizens who may not be uh, technologically savvy, to file their income tax via an online uh, chatbot interface. So the chatbot, um, the chat filing bot is available in English and Mandarin and technical jargons will be replaced by uh, taxpayers' natural language. So for example, if you're a taxi driver, instead of saying uh, revenue, we will actually put down the terms like total passenger fares. Uh, so this is an example of combining uh, user experience design skills uh, with technology to deliver digital convenience to our non-savvy taxpayers. Uh, while we have discontinued our chat filing this year, uh, as we are currently extending our income pre-feeding for our private hire drivers, 
Um, but the chat filing bot actually set the foundation for many of our other uh, bot services as well. So just to illust uh, a quick illustration on our chat filing bot, uh, as you can see, uh, the process of text filing is simplified into a series of simple uh, question and answer uh, and in a language that is easily understood uh, by our taxpayers. Besides uh, simplifying text filing for taxpayers, we are also constantly looking to offer more uh, convenient modes of payment for taxpayers to pay taxes, such as uh, internet banking or other mobile payments. Uh, so taxpayers uh, right now, they are also able to retrieve payment information, uh, payment related information via our chatbot. And so we not only have a chat filing, we also have uh, what you call a chat payment. Um, now to drive overall uh, digital adoption at our portal also, uh, we are using uh, digital tools to provide a step-by-step -step, uh, personalized guide to help taxpayers complete their transaction uh, when they use our portal online. Uh, so you can imagine it as a kind of uh, concierge or butler that pops up as and when uh, you hit an issue while you are going through our portal to complete the transaction. Uh, so for example, when taxpayers log into our portal, if they require to file taxes, uh, a pop-up will actually initiate to ask them if they require assistance. If they do, then the, uh, do, the tool will actually guide the taxpayer through the tax filing process. Uh, also at specific parts of the portal, uh, where we know taxpayers typically will have some questions, um, the concierge will also pop up and give some tips to the taxpayer on, to know what to look out for. So as I mentioned on the communication front as well, um, we are currently scaling up the use of our virtual uh, intelligent chat assistance, uh, which leverages on uh, Google's dialog, uh, dialog flow uh, NLP engine to achieve better performance and accuracy as well. Uh, so we are building it on a, a whole of government platform so that the experience will be seamless for the citizens going through different government agencies. Uh, beyond check function, uh, taxpayers are also able to indicate their preferences for digital notices. Uh, and to date, 97% uh, of our notices and letters are digital by default. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we are scaling up the use of our uh, Vika chatbot as it can not only improve the user experience, but also reduce the frontline uh, manpower that's needed to handle general inquiries and transaction. And being on a whole of government platform, uh, we do envisage that that will enable us to possibly have a super bot in the future, which is able to then provide information to our citizens across different government agencies uh, on platforms such as the uh, Life SG app that I shared earlier. So overall, our digital adoption rate has always been uh, relatively high, uh, with only about 0.2% uh, of our service contacts uh, being non-digital, uh, but we are committed to continue to drive digital adoption uh, across the whole of IRAS as well as the whole of uh, national level as well. So other than uh, online platforms and in initiatives, we are also leveraging on data to monitor our progress and discover new opportunities. For example, um, we use a whole of government analytics dashboard to maintain oversight of our website and digital services. Um, so it not only is able to give us things like a uh, total number of visits, uh, average time spent by our visitors on our website, uh, it also gives us a benchmark uh, against the performance on other government agencies and so that we know where we stand across our other our government agencies and also where IRSs are, and also whom we can learn from uh, in terms of our website design. So internally within IRAS, we also build our own uh, dashboard to track operation level data and to monitor our frontline operations as well. So lastly, um, besides having a seamless uh, digital experience and leveraging on data, uh, we strongly believe in empowering our officers and our staff uh, to drive uh, better customer experience. So although our discussion today is on digitalizing of uh, tax administration, um, the opportunity areas for greater digital digitalization are best discovered through our frontline staff actually. So our frontline staff interact with our customers uh, and they hear the needs and pain points on a day-to-day -day basis. So they are the voice of our customers. Uh, so it's, it is important to create an open and collaborative environment uh, where our staff are encouraged to connect with their peers, uh, brainstorm, and innovate on the issues that they hear um, on a daily basis. 
So the initiatives that I shared today uh, and what we have done uh, is only possible because we have a, a future ready workforce. So we have trained our frontline officers uh, with new skills and capabilities such as um, data analytics, customer experience design, uh, bot development, as well as robotic process automation. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, COVID-19, while it has accelerated dig digitalization, um, I believe that it's our people who made the difference and innovated to make uh, the digital experience a positive one for our citizens. Uh, so with that, I've uh, come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for the very comprehensive presentation about the different examples of like how Sing Singapore government used the like, technology to uh, for test administration. So, uh, so I think that like so, so it's, it's it's very nice that you share not only the examples but also the rationale behind the design of these different applications and services and what you want to achieve at the end. So it's always about satisfaction of the users, uh, about the seamless experience, about convenience. So these are some very important design principles that I guess will be relevant to not just developed countries, but also developed countries as well. So th thanks a lot for, for the insights. So, uh, so let's move to the next example from Malaysia. So let's welcome Ms. Suryanti Iser who is the senior test executive of the Inland Revenue Board of Malaysia. Uh, hi. Hi, 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 Ms. Hi. Isa. OK, so the floor is yours. OK, thank you, uh, Mr. Feng Chen. OK, uh, good afternoon, good day, everyone. Uh, uh, let me share out my uh, slide. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, my name is Suryanti Isa and on behalf of uh, Indian Revenue Board of Malaysia, uh, I would like to thank you and appreciate uh, UNESCO for giving us the opportunity to share and present uh, on IRB Malaysia's digital transformation. I'll start my presentation uh, on uh, the ICT innovation at IRB Malaysia. Digitalization of tax administration in IRB Malaysia uh, has started back in the year 2000 uh, and it has been an uh, ongoing process ever since. For us, the digitalization is a process of streamlining our activities uh, in order for us to do better. To adopt digitalization are uh, known as hasil transformation as shape and redefining our tax landscape. Before the year 2000, uh, under the emerging phase, uh, RB has used centralized tax system, which is based on mainframe technology and dump terminal. Subsequently, uh, in the year 2000, RB Malaysia has introduced self-assessment system. However, we still rely on the mainframe technology to support large-scale uh, computing and high-volume transactions for our core tax uh, system in line with change from form assessment to self-assessment. As of now, with the implementations of big data platform and also integrated tech system, there are more opportunities, optimization of work process, data synchronization through seamless integration and support in business model. In year 2019, RB Malaysia has entered a new phase uh, of digital transformation known as HASIL transformation. We have built our own platform infrastructure that aims at uh, managing technology complexities in the fast changing environment. Uh, we also enhance the express service experience to be more competitive in this digital era. Uh, the platform also uh, aims at studying the behavior of mission taxpayers and as well achieving our efficiency and strategic goals. A major component of this project is the development uh, of HASIL uh, integrated tax system, also known as HITS which enables IRB Malaysia to better manage its data resources. Other main components of this project uh, consist of re-engineering process, where improvement of automation uh, process and monitoring productivity is done through the system. 
must also adopt data analytic capabilities and enhance customer service experience, including their access to their information and services to get a real-time certainty on their tax liabilities. Uh, Malaysia has in fact made significant progress in the last few years. Uh, we have started uh, adopting and exploring new approaches by hiring new uh, skilled data scientists and also data engineers as well as developing analytic tools. With our big data platform, uh, we have managed to deal with the increasing amounts of structured and unstructured data that come from various sources. We also have the ability to process and analyze data in a real-time basis. Data monitoring uh, reduces the amount of information that we would otherwise have to request from taxpayers. Our big data analytics activity has become an effective tool to, for us to understand uh, the behavior of taxpayers through their patterns of individual or company towards tax compliance. It also help us to develop a full profile of the taxpayer by linking the data held internally and from external sources. Uh, it also improves a better and effective risk management tax system and also improves our ability to monitor tax compliance through the segmentation of tax payers. Okay. Uh, in our way, uh, we feel so fortunate that we had developed a very extensive online application that we can offer to various segments of tax payers. That technology, we are able to have continuous communication with the taxpayer. We believe the existing service uh, will help us to stay uh, connected, taxpayers, and then help them to cope with the current crisis. Indeed, we ourselves in uh, IRB had managed to avoid major disruptions of our operations through continuous activities via online. IRB offered extensive online tax services since 2004 where taxpayers are exposed to easy and better tax compliance experience to meet their tax obligation. Uh, it covers all taxation uh, cycle, starting from uh, first uh, tax registration, where we have uh, our e-data and e-commerce clinic. Then we have uh, advanced payment, we have our online uh, services, uh, such as ECP204, uh, Facilita to facilitate filing of tax return, uh, we do have our e-filing. Okay, for payment, we have via HASIL. And also, uh, finally, for amendment of the tax return uh, and appeal process, we have the e application for amended forms and also e rayuan For information, at the least, uh, early stage of implementation, all our online services apps are based on standalone needs. But, uh, effectively, from 2015, we managed to consolidate all the apps into one single inference for easier access by the taxpayer. As I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, for the registration, okay, uh, we also, uh, IRP also has worked closely with other government agencies uh, under MyCo ID. Okay, once a company is registered uh, with uh, the agency, Information will be transmitted to us daily and corporate tax areas will be registered automatically. For uh, e-filing kind of uh, return forms, uh, the e-filing uh, rate for individual itself is more than 90%. And uh, for the corporate uh, taxpayers, we have make it mandatory. With e-filing service, uh, delivery to customers could be improved and then uh, process of tax refund will be quicker does enable IRB to fulfill its mission to maintain its reputation as uh, well as increase public confidence uh, as a trusted tax administration. Uh, for advanced payments, uh, this is a secure and convenient tax payment method. In the future, we plan to introduce other payment methods to ease tax payment and thus also increase rate of e-payment, such as payment of tax through payment gateways, where payment can be made uh, by direct debit or recurring tax payment and also to implement e-wallet with QR code for payments using smartphone. RB will also implement digital refund payment. During the pandemic COVID-19, uh, it was indeed fortunate that RB has uh, in place extensive on applications uh, known as Easy Hustle to serve the various segments of taxpayers, facilitate uh, continuous communication with taxpayers with a few enhancements covering the entire taxation cycle, thus make it easier for taxpayers to meet their 
tax compliance obligations. Okay, uh, in year 2020, uh, IRB Malaysia had introduced a new initiative named as Montex. It is a centralized online service portal for taxpayers and is part of the digital service of IRB. The yeah, MyTax application acts as a single touchpoint platform related to all tax matters provided the following features, uh, a single sign-on by taxpayers to view their dashboard regarding uh, any tax matters, a responsive web display, a smart notification on real-time basis and does also provide uh, virtual services to the taxpayers. The example of my tax uh, view of the web version. Okay, as you can see, it covers tax profile information, uh, low tax payment status, tax inquiry, uh, customer survey, mailbox, a knowledge center platform, and also the way it also in covers digital audit, uh, auto refund, auto statement, and real time information. Next, we have the uh, example of the mobile version for my tax. Okay. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, digitalization of process has truly paved the way for forward in terms to improve taxpayer experience uh, to meet their tax obligation. Digitalization has benefit both parties, uh, RRB and taxpayers, where it allows us to shape uh, internet efficiency and thus also to speed up our operations. To also improve the taxpayer experience when handling their tax matters besides being a cost-effective tool for clients. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have a video presentation. Okay, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I end my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Isa, for your presentation about the test system in Malaysia. So it's a very interesting example. So I actually I, I like the example of like emphasizing the cross-platform experience of the test payer. So it's like I think it's a good good design like that that, that allow people to do the services any places like so across like platforms. OK, so. Uh, so thanks a lot. And so here is our last presentation from Mr. Sekar Laranyan from uh, Amazon Web Service. So who is the head of finance and regulation at AWS? So let's welcome Ms. Laranyan. OK, he's ready. <laughs> OK, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Could you see my slides okay? Perfect. Yes. Next slide. So in the next three years, there will be more data created than in the past 30 years combined. Tax authorities around the world are grappling with dealing with big data to derive relevant insights. This also includes, by the way, central banks and financial services regulators, again, around the world. According to the Big Data and AI Exec Survey from 2021, 92% of blue chip companies cited people, business processes, and culture as their greatest challenges in leveraging data to achieve higher output and productivity. Hello, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Saket Narayan, and I lead the finance and regulation industry for Amazon Web Services, AWS, across Australia, New Zealand, and the Oceania region. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share 
some of our insights and perspectives with you today from our work with uh, financial sector customers, both across public sector and commercial sector around the world, uh, which includes a number of tax authorities globally. So um, we believe that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD Tax Maturity Model 3.0, does an excellent job at defining what good looks like for our tax authorities, subject to their uh, local context, obviously, and business imperatives. And so as I reflect on the aspirational state attributes, it certainly helps to define, um, as per Jenny's point on the, on the panel before, uh, perhaps an evolving target state for a digital tax ecosystem. So when you reflect on the key attributes, a whole of society uh, perspective on digital identity, not just looking at it from a taxation perspective, but other whole of life events, touch points being increasingly built into tax based natural system. This came up before as well. Um, the use of data analytics to drive more of a pull approach as opposed to a push approach from a data analytics perspective. And again, leveraging the power of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to even allow authorities to do a rem remote audit using AI and really getting sophisticated and streamlined uh, on the supervision um, mandates. Tax laws and legislation, uh, this comes up quite a lot in terms of our conversations, again, globally, um, how the tax laws and legislation and regulations uh, can be designed with, uh, with an approach uh, which promotes rules as code, with tagging and pseudocode and so on and so forth. And I think we've just heard a lot of good things around future skills, you know, having that learning needs analysis approach uh, for the needs of a future taxation practice and an operation, having that holistic strategic uh, workforce planning. So I just wanted to pause here and just uh, uh, share with you that AWS uh, supports millions of customers around the world, uh, including over 7,500 government institutions. And whilst I have a lot to share on the six building blocks of the digital tax maturity model, uh, which the OECD prescribes, uh, given the less than 10 minutes, and I know how it's uh, getting late for everybody, uh, I'm just going to briefly touch on just a few aspects today, but would be delighted to, uh, to organize a follow-up call with, with anyone that's interested in our perspective. So in the US, uh, the Biden administration issued an executive order on the 13th December 2021 with a view to improve customer experiences offered by public sector agencies. The order called out the need, which is the bit that stood out for me, was the need to reduce reliance on paperwork and 9 billion hours of processing time, simplifying both public facing and internal processes to improve efficiency. Uh, similar report done here uh, recently, Jenny might be across this, uh, just recent here in Australia by the Financial Regulatory Assessment Authority, the FRA, on the performance of one of our financial services regulators, again, highlighting the need to improve the user experience offered by public sector authorities. So what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say here is customer experience in a digital ecosystem, whether it's tax, financial services regulation, or central banking, is a priority. Now, some of the common challenges we are hearing from departments of revenue and taxation are that they're reliant on, in a in, in, in number of cases, on outdated legacy systems, including contact centers that are expensive, difficult to maintain, and lack advanced analytics and AI and ML capabilities. Customers tell us that they are overwhelmed by high demand, insufficient staff, and a lack of digital tools in many cases to communicate with individuals and businesses. Customers also expressed interest in automation tools to efficiently handle workload to avoid delayed processing and late payment penalties. I think it was the IRS in US announced on February 1, 2022, that they're using enterprise automation to increase efficiency and improve customer satisfaction. And so whilst, as we have heard on the panel today, while some tax agencies have improved the delivery of e-services, electronic services for registration and payment, 
many would benefit from system modernization to improve that customer engagement and to reduce workload burden by automating workflows and document processing and to focus enforcement efforts through advanced data analytics and AI and ML. Now, there is no dispute here. Tax authorities want more value from their data. We hear from revenue authorities all the time that they're looking to extract more value from their data, but often struggle to capture, store, and analyze all the data that's generated by the modern uh, digital businesses in the different forms. Data is coming from new sources, you know, is increasingly diverse, there's structured data, there's unstructured data, semi-structured data. It needs to be securely accessed and analyzed by any number of applications and people. As I started at the beginning of the, my presentation, data volumes are increasing at an unprecedented rate, exploding from terabytes to petabytes and sometimes exabytes of data. Traditional on-premises data analytics and uh, systems and approaches just can't handle these data volumes. And if they're handling it today, you can be sure they won't be able to handle it in the future. So they require a different approach to, uh, to digitalization uh, at the ecosystem level and having the right tools to support that. And while machine learning, because that's came up a number of times um, in our conversation this evening, while machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches are obviously transformative in their capabilities and potential, we also hear from our customers that organizations are facing the challenges of hiring the right data science skills in the market. I think it was Tuppen on, on the call um, on our on our discussion earlier who talked about the skills challenges in developing nations. Uh, Tuppen, what I would like to say that we hear of the skill challenges in the developed nations too. This comes up very regularly. Tax authorities tell us about their visions of becoming data-driven organization. Came up multiple times today. So I hear you ask, what does a data-driven organization look like from an Amazon perspective or an Amazon Web Services perspective? Because we like to say we are a very data-driven organization. We have a very feedback-driven organization. And so in our view, a data-driven organization looks somewhere along these lines. Data-driven organizations seek the truth by treating data like an organizational asset. No longer the property of individual departments, no longer the challenges of getting access to that data. They set up systems to collect, store, organize, and process valuable data and make it accessible in a secure way based on consent to the people and applications that need it. They also use technologies like machine learning to unlock new value from their data, such as improving operational efficiency, optimizing processes, developing new products and revenue streams, and building better customer, better, more personalized experiences for the constituents. So given the significant role of uh, data analytics, machine learning and AI in a digital tax ecosystem, I know it's a financial services regulator example, but I wanted to just briefly draw your attention um, to just one of our customer um, stories from the US federal financial services regulator, FINRA. Now, FINRA needed a platform that could ingest, process, and store 80 billion market events on an average day and dynamically scale that system to process up to 240 billion events on a peak day. FINRA very quickly realized that this sort of a scale of data collection and analytics is just not possible using the on-premises system. So FINRA built a data lake uh, and a data analytics platform on AWS using some of our services such as Amazon S3 and Amazon EMR to store and analyze data from 3000 broker dealers and 22 exchanges. This platform now gives FINRA the ability to detect uh, market manipulation, insider trading, financial fraud detection, at a scale that is unprecedented. Now, we, we heard about the, the COVID uh, effect on digitalization before, and I wanted to just point out that the McKinsey report from October 2021 is not wrong in saying that during the COVID pandemic, digital adoption took a quantum leap at both the organizational and industry levels. 
and accelerated digitization efforts by several years. As Rex mentioned before, many of these changes started as temporary measures, but are definitely here to stay. And the approach to that rapid delivery, because you had to during a pandemic, you had to get call centers up and running. We have a number of examples. I just don't have time to talk, go through all of them, particularly with tax authorities around the world who managed to set up new contact centers to process COVID relief payments in a time frame of 36 to 48 hours at scale. So just I'll just touch on one example. In just four weeks, HMRC, the Revenue and Customs Authority in UK, working with their IT partners, delivered a nationwide scalable digital solution on AWS called the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme, CJRS, paying out more than 69.3 billion pounds, supporting the income of more than 11.7 million jobs and achieving a customer satisfaction score of more than 90%. As I mentioned before, Similarly, a number of our other revenue authorities around the world are leveraging AWS cloud services to drive uh, that business transformation, the digital transformation. Amazon Connect, I touched on this before, our cloud-based contact center technology uh, has seen a huge interest in uptake from our customers globally as it allows to, uh, one, radically improve the customer experiences, two, allows to easily automate, track, and manage tasks, but also in other domains like intelligent document processing. Uh, tax agency, as we all know, have got a lot more paper processes than most of the counterparts in other areas of government. And um, uh, the uh, use of technology such as intelligent document processing is really allowing the authorities to reduce manual data entry for processing paper filings, such as applications, forms, payments, and refunds. And digitizing documents obviously increases efficiency by enabling agency staff to index, filter, easily search for individuals and businesses. And lastly, I wanted to touch on the, on the fraud prevention angle as well. Obviously, tax and revenue agencies are under significant pressure to detect and prevent uh, bad actors from stealing someone's identity or tax evasion and black economy type uh, crime use cases. And so one of the services that we've seen a number of our financial sector customers use it quite successfully is a, as a service called Amazon Fraud Detector, which uses machine learning and voice recognition technology to detect and prevent fraud. In 2018, uh, PwC uh, published a report here in Australia on the impact to the economy um, uh, from illegal phoenixing, uh, a tax evasion crime, and estimated a figure of over 2.85 billion to over $5 billion uh, economic impact to the Australian economy every year. And so uh, a, a number of these use cases exist where machine learning and artificial te uh, intelligence technologies have uh, an outsized impact to solving and helping some of those uh, challenges. So as you can see, uh, cloud adoption is, is key uh, to any digital transformation. We see our finance authorities uh, making cloud adoption a, a, an integral or a key pillar uh, to drive the business transformation, uh, right from uh, driving a better customer experience uh, to the constituents, to cloud-based contact centers, to data lakes and analytics, blockchain and distributed ledger technology uh, to use of AI and ML to drive uh, business efficiencies. So in the interest of time, I'll skip this slide um, after saying that the role of governance, again, one of those core pillars uh, when we think about the digital tax maturity model 3.0, uh, it just cannot be overstated. Staying on top of compliance, regulations, data breach handling policies and procedures are just so important. And of course, once you have the right data maturity with sufficient quantity of good quality data set, I want to stress that sufficient quantity of good quality data, machine readable and executable legislation and tax rule will greatly help with the artificial intelligence and machine learning led advancements, but also for trust, transparency, traceability, accountability, uh, auditing and appealability of government decision-making. Again, I think Jenny made a really good point around the robo debt, uh, the, uh, you know, who takes accountability if a machine learning algorithm uh, does not uh, produce expected outcomes. Uh, it's those things become really important to think about. 
conscious of time, I'll finish my segment with where I started. 92% of blue chip companies cited people, business processes, and culture as their greatest challenges in leveraging data analytics to achieve higher output and productivity, to really lead that business transformation. Transformation isn't doing the same things better. It's doing new things and doing them differently. Thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your very nice presentation. So it's nice that you make a great remark at the end. So to emphasize, it's not just about IT, but also other about people, about the policy, about the business processes and culture that makes things happen, I guess. So it's very important to know. And I think it's also interesting to, to see from the perspective of an IT service provider that what IT is capable in doing to, to help test administration. So it's a very different perspective. So I think it's equally important for, for the test administration to know what are the possibilities that are available in the market. So it's very nice uh, like uh, information for all of us, I guess. So uh, here we have Still, we have about five minutes left, so I have received one question from the audience. <laughs> so this is like a, a question about the, the the effectiveness of like using all these sort of IT solutions in test administration. So, so is there any benchmark of like what is like the benefit of using these innovations in test collection? So how much does it improve the test revenues, like re relatively speaking? So is there any benchmark that like give a concrete number like do we have 5%, 10% increase? So is it the case in some of the countries here? So, sorry, Frank, is that a question for me? Or is that one for the panel? Uh, for, for all the panelists. <laughs> so like because like they're yeah. from different countries. Yeah. So, so to see whether there are any examples to share. So as we know, so when we implement IT, so we want to assess the performance in the long term, right? So, so is there any benchmarking that has been done like, to see like, like so I, I've seen like examples like you, you measure customer satisfaction, so which is good. So like this one of the indicator of like of the success of the system, but another direct indicator will be like the revenue that is collected, right? So, is there any such measures in some of the countries that we have seen today? No. Maybe I'm. I am not sure. Maybe if there are no comments from the participants, shall we maybe move? Uh, shall we have a, another question? I got also another question from another participant asking about uh, how is the legislation regarding artificial intelligence and machine learning, especially for what concern, for example, the data sharing or privacy of the citizens that are sharing their data. I would actually be quite interested in knowing uh, what is the experience of the current uh, countries that have been presenting here, maybe starting by Singapore, if it's uh, OK. I have seen that you implement a lot of like AI and machine learning in your uh, administration. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, Hello. Um, th that isn't ne ne actually my uh, field of uh, knowledge, so uh, I'm, I, I don't really have an answer to that. But um, I guess in general, um, right now we haven't gone into the part about um, talking about the governance of AI at this point in time. I think we are kind of still catching up in terms of um, getting uh, the use cases up and getting the, the capabilities and the right people in at the moment. Um, but of course, you know, beyond that is really then um, how do we uh, look at the governance of AI and how do we use it properly? Um, so um, that's just my my take at the moment. Uh, perhaps yeah. others uh, who are who are better, the few of AI can uh, give a better answer than what I just gave. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you sharing your uh, opinion because really it was just like to get like uh, insight and, and ideas from you. And of course, if there are any other person who would like to share their token on uh, their token uh, on uh, on that that would also be very nice hmm. 
know, I just see Rachel that is commenting to your point, Frank. Yeah, I mean, if you want, Rachel, if you want to talk it aloud, that is also okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know if there are any other questions from the from oh, there the is audience. a raised hand. Yeah, from the audience. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes, oh. please go ahead. Um, hello, this is Andrew Bloomfield from Crown Agents. Um, uh, extremely Andrew. interesting um, uh, presentations um, and uh, and food for thought. One question that was uh, that I have, which was slightly alluded to earlier on, um, is when automatic systems work well, they're fantastic, but there needs to be a sort of um, uh, an escape hatch, as it were. I, I, I know in the in the UK, um, sometimes when things go wrong or have people or people have problems that that can't be fitted into a sort of an automatic decision tree. Often it can be very difficult indeed to 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 get um, uh, problems addressed. Do um, is anybody um, who's representing one of the um, you know newly highly automated countries? Do you have any um, policies or, or or ways of dealing with, um, with with these sort of problem issues that that are out of the ordinary flow of things? Well, um, if I may, well, I don't represent a tax authority, but I can share with you um, the Malaysian experience which we have when we first introduced um, e-filing. And actually, we started off with uh, emailing scanned copies of forms, and then we moved on to an actual integrated uh, interface. Um, there were a lot of issues. There were a lot of issues with taxpayers. And what the tax authorities did was they made sure they set up a hotline, a customer service. It was um, they opened up their their offices. They opened up their um, um, actual. They did a lot of road shows. They did a lot of twenty four hour call lines. They did, you know they had people come in and they helped them with all these computers set up and to do the filing there and then. So a lot of that was done and that was done for a few years. That wasn't done just the one, the first time it was um, introduced, that was actually done for quite a few years. And then they also didn't do a hard and fast, oh, we are only gonna take everything e, you know, right now from this date forward. No, there was a mix that was allowed for a period of time, and that was to allow taxpayers to get comfortable with the ideas. So you had the option of doing a physical filing or an e-filing, and that physical filing, um, I think, eventually may have been phased out. That may, may not be the case. It may be that it's still allowed for certain regions, which are a bit more remote and may have difficulty. So I think the 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 sort of it's not really an escape hatch, but more like a safety net is to not do a hard and fast um, shift. It has to be very gradual. There has to be a lot of flexibility and uh, both systems kind of have to run in tandem. If that answers the question. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Um, I could see that as a good policy of introducing um, um, more technology and IT. But for example, uh, just off the top of my head, um, and, I, and I'm obviously in the UK, so that's um, not in not in Asia Pacific. But uh, I, I guess the, the the same problems will be universal. For example, um, if you are um, say say you have a sort of a complete you say you, you have more than one income and you have um uh, again I'm sort of a compliance issue that you dispute with um with with in, in one income stream and that affects the other. Um I, I found in personal experience that um it was very difficult to actually get 
um, my problems addressed because the way that the uh, HMRC was dealing with, with me was not holistic. It was, um, you know, one issue was being dealt with in Wales, one issue was being dealt with in Glasgow, one issue was being dealt with in, in London, and there was no communication bet uh, between them, and everything was, was kind of automated. Now, I suspect that that's bad design of a system, uh, frankly, but um, what I found was that I, I could not discuss my case with, with somebody um, with, and, until I put in an actual complaint, which, which I don't think it should have been necessary. There should have been a, um, um, a less aggressive and formal way of, of, of dealing with, uh, with, a, with a problem. But what I found was, was that no one was, was able to, to, to deal with holistically. And I think I'm probably answering my own question, which is you need to treat people holistically. But has, do any of the representatives have sort of similar experiences where, um, um, where you've had to have ways of dealing with issues that sort of step outside the automatic, uh, automatic procedures? I hope I've made my question clear. And thank you for your answer. Um, yeah, so maybe I can add to that from uh, Singapore. Um, so, for example, you know, we shared that we we actually do uh, invest a lot in our chatbots, and uh, we kind of want it to be an automated system that actually can handle most of the general inquiries. Um, but we do understand that you know also that uh, some customers, or in certain cases, they really need uh, an an officer or somebody to deal with the issue. Um, so, for example, we do then therefore link uh, the experience to a live chat service. So, for example, you know, if um, the bot is unable to understand or, or, or give a proper answer or the, the text may actually do a thumbs down, um, that's when it automatically then triggers a, a live chat uh, agent to actually come in to step in to, to provide, I guess that's what um, the holistic and the, the, over, um, the overview of, I mean, the human touch la, to, to, to really kind of address the issue. So, um, I, I can understand the, the frustrations. Um, but I think, yes, um, the, the automated services is not going to solve all problems uh, and the, the human must always be at the back, you know, to, to really stand by and step in when the, there's a lapse in terms of what the, the robot can do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. That's, that's interesting and obviously uh, um, what I would certainly regard as a good approach. Um, and I think one thing, again, that it stresses and it was mentioned earlier as well, is that um, there needs to, everyone needs to, to be able to benefit from, from the systems. You know, the taxpayer needs to see the advantages as well as the tax administration. And I think in the UK, when we first started to um, start doing um, e-governance, it, it was largely... Um, the impetus was largely to sort of help the administration reduce its costs and any benefit to the taxpayer was a sort of a, um, a what we call a windfall benefit. It wasn't the purpose of doing it. And I think that was a historic mistake. Um, so thank you for your answer. And I, 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 I think that that's a, a very creative and, and good approach to the issue. And I'm sorry for um, indulging myself with these questions, but it's very interesting uh, to hear your answers. Actually, I think you raised a very good point, and, and I think Rex answered it very well as well, is that we cannot look at automation as a single layer solution. What automation does is to ease things, to make things more effective, and and in the case of customer service, it's it's more of a filter than, than anything else. That human element still has to be there. But what it does is it makes it um, sort of gets it makes it easier for the, the officers to do their job by by getting rid of the the, the, you know, the base issues out of the way and leaving them free to handle the more uh, complex stuff. Thanks, I fully agree. Well, I think that uh, I would like to thank, let's say, all of you. I think that maybe, Frank, uh, we could uh, wrap it up. I mean, there are okay. several other questions, but unfortunately, because of the time and the time uh, uh, limitation, we may not be able to go on. But however, feel free to send us some 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 emails and this will be given to the 
panelists, so we might be able to answer you back. So I don't know, Frank, if you want to. Oh, okay, so thank you again for all the presentations and also the interesting discussion. So we have a nice remark at the end, I guess. So we have like, we, we need to think about the people that are using the IT. So actually it's the message that I give to my student anytime for any <laughs> IS courses. <laughs> okay, so which is good, which is very relevant. So thanks again. So, uh, so uh, I guess we will uh, give the floor to the moderator, oh, no, to, to, the, to the MC. Thank you, Professor yeah. Frank, for yeah. uh, effectively moderating this ses session, um, even though we have some technical challenges. Um, before coming to the closing session, uh, may I request all to help fill in the evaluation survey available in the chat box uh, that will help us to uh, get the, the comment to improve our related work. I would now like to invite Mr. Alberto Iskut, Economic Affairs Officer, Financing for Development Section to provide closing remarks. Over to you, Alberto. Thank you so much, Pachara. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, really, it was a, a really fantastic event. Uh, I shouldn't say this because I'm part of the, organize, the organization, but I have to say that I learned a lot and there were so many, you know, different perspectives, you know, from practitioners, from, from the tax administration, from academics, even from, you know, from data uh, companies like Amazon. So uh, it was very rich, I think. And uh, I think that uh, there are some, some themes that are you know emerging from all this discussion i would say so that i would start by saying that and this is really a, a silent revolution that is happening in tax administration <clears throat> i mean silent because it's not the kind of things that make the you know the headlines in the newspapers you don't you don't hear much about uh, well this country is improving the efficiency of tax administration <clears throat> or customers are happier. Uh, you don't see that kind of headlines anywhere, but uh, it seems to be, well, it's a reality. It is happening. I remember like, uh, you know, 17 years ago, I was uh, in Canada before coming to, to Thailand to work at ESCAP and I had to file my, my tax returns. And uh, it was uh, basically a full day affair, you know, I, I, I didn't do it uh, electronically, electronic, you know, e-filing was kind of starting, but it was not mandatory, it was an option, but uh, most people, educated people like me, I mean, I, I got a PhD, uh, I still use, uh, you know, the manual uh, filing. And uh, in the case of Canada, again, I don't want to criticize any tax administration, but the process was extremely complicated because there were tax deductions, for example, for medical expenses. So I have to collect all my invoices from, you know, medicines that I, I mean, it's not that I have so many medical problems, but, you know, dentists, you know, things that were not covered by the public uh, health insurance, and then attach it to the tax return in order to get some deduction, right? But um, the process it took a lot of time, you know, it's not just the filing of the report, but, you know, just including all these attachments. And then, uh, OK, that was my problem. But then that that, uh, you know, tax return went to an official uh, at the tax administration. And this person has to go to the computer, enter all the information, verify that the, the information in the attachment was correct. So imagine, you know, it took me a full day. How many hours it could take to, a, you know, even a very experienced tax official, you know, probably at least uh, one hour, I would say, well, 30 minutes, I don't know. But imagine the number of tax returns this, uh, you know, this office has to handle, right? So uh, it was, uh, I mean, definitely, you know, e-filing already, you know, created enormous, enormous efficiencies. And the, the kind of thing we are seeing now, I mean, they go much beyond e filing, you know, what we have heard about, you know, controlling tax invoices and, you know, try to detect fraud. Uh, we haven't discussed so much about uh, compliance method, but it was, you know, it was kind of referred to in some of the presentations. So it's definitely, I mean, a lot of, you know, good things are happening that are going to, to, to make the, the business of tax administration, you know, a lot easier. But uh, we have also heard uh, at the end, and well, not only at the end, I mean, in many parts of this uh, uh, event, about the importance of uh, facilitating the experience of the of the clients, of the of the taxpayers, right? And that is also very important because um, it was said very well in this. I think that uh, 
in the presentation about the, the Bangladesh, right? By um, yeah, by Tap Tapan Sakar about the you know that uh, you know when uh, the experiences when people feel that they are you know treated well by the tax administration, they have more incentives uh, to to pay their taxes, and you know that you know results in in better compliance as well. So it's, it's it's quite I mean uh, encouraging I have to say everything we have he heard. Uh, there are some issues that you know needs to be taken into account, uh, especially in developing countries. You know the there are of course there are issues of capacities, uh, not just of not only of tax administration but also taxpayers. So this idea of flexibility of allowing a kind of soft transition from traditional, you know, manual methods to online uh, or, or, you know, more electronic methods. I mean, it's important. It is also, uh, I mean, this is a constant uh, issue in the literature on, on the um, digital finance, uh, or the financial inclusion, that the, the issue of capacities to, you know, to even to have a mobile phone, right? Many people in, in the developing countries don't even have a mobile phone or they share a mobile phone among many people. So there are issues of privacy. So there are uh, there are quite a lot of issues that need to be uh, considered very carefully at the so-called uh, bottom of the pyramid, you know, in these countries. So they have to be probably a mixed approach. Uh, well, of course, continuing all this drive towards optimization, you know, digitalization of taxation. I mean, this is extremely, you know, good. But there has to be also consideration of the population that is excluded, you know, from these processes. Uh, the issue that was also mentioned by many about the age. Uh, my mother uh, cannot really use a, a you know, um, a, a, a smartphone. So I mean, she couldn't uh, file. A tax returns is in a you know a phone. So I mean there, there are issues like that, you know, these issues, issues of you know digital literacy, etc. Right. So this this needs to be considered. Um and of course the I mean this probably is a bit of a you know it's a point that is made so many times about the when we start to rely a lot on very complex uh, AI or machine learning processes, you know, how these all the algorithms are, you know, actually operating, uh, whether they can, uh, you know, maybe inadvertently introduce biases, right? It happens in, in, in some areas of digital finance. So these are things that are very, very complex, uh, but of course uh, need to be tackled as well. So anyway, I would like to conclude uh, saying that uh, the the purpose of this workshop besides having this exchange and disseminating information is also uh, for us uh, ESCAP to, to get additional feedback and ideas for a manual we are uh, finalizing on the, you know, the digitalization of tax administrations, which has a little bit of more of a focus on, on compliance issues. Uh, so, but many, many of the topics discussed today are, are also there. So we will basically uh, finalize this report. You know, we will incorporate many of the very good ideas that we have heard today. And we are going to the to share this with all of you, everybody who registered, of course, to this workshop. And uh, we hope that it will be a good uh, material for not only for tax administration, but also for for, you know, you know, for the public that, you know, is interested in learning about these these topics. So, well, on that note, uh, I again want to thank everybody uh, once again, you know, the speakers for fantastic uh, presentations. But I also want to to thank very much, you know, my colleagues, uh, Alfonso, uh, Professor Chan, uh, Pachara, uh, because without them, this couldn't have happened. Uh, so you have done a very good job, colleagues. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, well, I think that on that note, uh, I would like to close the this workshop, and I I wish the, we have another opportunity to continue this discussion down the road. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Alberto, for the insightful closing remarks, and thank you all again for joining our workshop today. Please note that all materials, PowerPoint presentation, and video recording of this workshop will be uploaded to our event webpage soon. Please stay healthy and happy, and we look forward to seeing you again in our next meeting. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.